Section 1 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Crawling Hands by P. A. Connolly. Chapter 1. We Visit Hedgewood. Mr. Hayden, I will take that dictation now. Don't let me catch you at it, I growled, as I banged down the top of my desk. And snatching up my cap, I dashed past a startled young lady, and almost over a diminutive messenger boy, who loomed suddenly in the doorway. He held out a telegram. And this is where my joyride is knocked in the head, I exclaimed savagely. Tearing open the envelope, I read the following. We'll arrive tomorrow, 10 a.m., to inspect Hedgewood. Meet us. F.S. Avery. Us? I muttered. How many is us? With the message in my hand, I rushed into my partner's room, happy for the excuse the telegram offered. Jim, I said hurriedly, get your hat and come quick. We're going to take a spin into the country. Jim glanced up out of lazy eyes, his big form sprawling over his large, easy swivel chair. Sorry, old man, he drawled, but we can't both neglect the business. You run along and take your pleasure trip, and I will stay here and perform my daily toil. Jim's toil usually consisted in jollying reluctant customers. All right, I said, darting to the door. I'll wait two minutes in the machine. I cranked up and was sitting at the wheel when Jim sauntered leisurely out of the lobby. Jimmy, I said, as I threw the clutch into the slow speed and threaded carefully through the downtown traffic. Do you believe in spirits? Only in the wet, Dickie. You're not going to get extravagant and buy me a drink, are you? He asked wistfully. No, Jimmy, I'm not, but I am going to take you out to the haunted house. Jim's eyes lit up. Have you heard from Avery? Are they going to take the place? I believe so, I said, handing him the telegram. The correspondence would indicate it, and they certainly wouldn't come way out here if they didn't mean business. Good, said Jim. I am glad, however, that we shall have a chance to inspect the old house before it is taken over. What shape is it in? The object of this trip, my boy, is to find out. Mr. Orland said, however, that he would leave it in first-class condition, and as he has been gone only a week, I don't imagine it will need anything but an airing and dusting. Jim bent over to light a cigar as I increased the speed. Dick, he asked, why not take advantage of this opportunity to try to unravel the mystery that surrounds Hedgewood? What do you say to stay in there all night? You don't mean to say... I exclaimed, that you take any stock in the absurd stories that are floating around about Orland and his house. Jim smoked in silence for a full minute. Yes, Dick, I do, he replied finally. I glanced at my companion in surprise. His face was serious. Light-hearted, frivolous Jim Aikens, society and all-around good fellow, a believer in ghosts. An old-fashioned conventional ghost, too. I let this thought sink in as we ran smoothly and quietly along the deserted country road. "'What is your version of the story?' I asked at length. "'I have heard so many I can't keep track of them.' "'Mine? Oh, mine is the orthodox one. The Orleans always had a bad reputation. They are said to be a family of stranglers. That is, once in every second or third generation one of them has been born with this mania.' The first one to develop it choked his wife to death and was effectually cured of the habit by his father, who cut off both his hands. The natives here say that it is his spirit which now haunts the place, seeking its lost hands. Bosh, Jim, I said. That is mere idle superstition. Maybe. At the same time, I, I also believe, as you know, I interrupted, in psychic phenomena. And curiously enough, it was my article on demonology in last month's Observer that caused Orland, who is an investigator, to place the business in my hands. Did Orland come to you in person? asked Jim quickly. Yes. The present Orland is said to have inherited the curse, and to have the Orland hands. The Orland hands? Yes, immense, hairy, spottery things. My involuntary start swerved the machine toward the ditch. What's the matter? Nothing, I replied, and lapsed into silence. As a matter of fact, Jim's last words had given me a disagreeable sensation. 
For ten days ever since John Orland's visit, I had been struggling with an uncanny feeling, which threatened to become an obsession, and which was induced wholly by the singular malformation of which Jim had referred. I had found in Orland a refined, highly cultured gentleman, well past middle age, charming in manner and appearance. At the time, I had noticed nothing peculiar about him except that during the whole of our interview, which lasted perhaps thirty minutes, he persistently kept his hands hidden beneath his slouch hat, which he held in his lap. When he was going, he arose suddenly, and his hat dropped to the floor, exposing his hands. At the sight, I had instinctively recoiled. Never before had I seen such hands. Large they were, singularly large and bony, and possessing monstrous power. It was not, however, their size which had impressed me so disagreeably, but the fact that they were in constant motion. The fingers writhed and twisted about each other like snakes, or, as Jim expressed it, like huge, hairy spiders. I recalled how he stood, regarding me curiously, coldly, but making no further effort to conceal his deformity. Then, without a word, he had extended his right hand, and without volition on my part, indeed against my will, my own hand had been drawn to arm's length and dropped, inert and lifeless, into that huge, hairy clasp. I shuddered then, and I shudder again now at the recollection. Imagine such a hand at one's throat. Ugh. It was this, and a certain promise which he had exacted from me, and which at the time seemed absurd, that gave rise to a vague uneasiness and mistrust. Not that I apprehended any difficulty or danger, but the thought persisted that I was dealing with a madman, one who, under certain circumstances, might prove to be a dangerous customer. But little was known about John Orland, and nothing of an evil character, except that which always attaches to any man who presumes to live entirely to himself. He had always occupied the old house to which we were going, as had his ancestors before him. With an old servant who was now with him in Europe, he had lived in the strictest seclusion. This fact, and the vague rumors of which Jim had spoken, were sufficient to keep the townspeople aloof, a result which he evidently desired. The exhilarating rush through the clean, sparkling air soon banished the senseless feeling of uneasiness which I had been harboring, and I gave myself up to the enjoyment of the ride. Life may hold better things than a smoothly going automobile, a good country road, and a bright June day, but I do not know where they are or what. Hedgewood was situated about ten miles from town, but we reached our destination all too soon. As we approached the property, we slowed down in order to get a better view. The land had a frontage on the road of about 1,000 feet, and ran back for perhaps twice that distance. It was, so far as we could see, entirely surrounded with a high and impenetrable hedge fence, broken only at the entrance by two square stone columns, which supported a heavy iron gate. Through the bars of this gate we could see a man at work among the shrubbery. Hello, I called. The man looked up and upon my signal came reluctantly toward us. He was a young fellow of twenty or thereabouts, with a rather stupid expression which gave way to distrust when I demanded entrance. "'You can't come in here,' he said. "'This is private property.' "'Yes, I know,' I answered. "'But Mr. Orland has put the place in my care.' Upon my answer he slowly produced a key, and inserting it into a padlock, swung back the massive gates. "'Do you live here?' I asked. "'No, sir.' I work here in the mornings, taking care of the grounds, but I'm going to quit. It's too scary. Well, it won't be so lonesome after this. There will be some people down tomorrow to take possession. And by the way, I added, I wish you would help us fix up things at the house before they come. Jump in. He shook his head vigorously. You couldn't get me in that house. It's bad enough out here. Why, what's the trouble? I asked. I ain't had no trouble, and I ain't hunting any. I'd find it quick enough if I went in there. He jerked his thumb toward the house. What would you find? I asked, smiling. He came closer to the car. His dull face looked ludicrous under its mask of terror. Ants, he whispered. Big hairy things that crawl around the floors like rats or spiders. Only they ain't. They're hands. End of section one. Section 2 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Crawling Hands by P. A. Connolly. Chapter 2. Jim Tries the Door. With a snort of disgust, I threw in the clutch, and we darted toward the house, leaving the rustic staring after us with his scythe suspended in mid-air. The front part of the grounds was covered with a heavy growth of forest trees, amid which, and about fifteen hundred feet from the entrance, stood the building, a massive structure of colonial style, and in a good state of preservation in spite of the fact that it had been built in revolutionary days. We pulled up at the wide veranda. Leaving Jim in the machine, I ran up the steps, and finding, after some trouble, the proper key, I threw open the door and entered the large central hall. The house was dark and stuffy. Jim joined me, and we went from room to room, raising the shades and windows. We had both experienced a feeling of depression upon first entering the house, but this soon wore off under the refreshing influence of the light and air. The rooms were large, with high ceilings, and well furnished, most of them in the fashion of a bygone day. But the living room and library in several of the bedrooms were fitted out in the most modern style. On the library table I found an envelope containing a key and a letter addressed to me which read as follows. Mr. Richard Hayden, dear sir, you will remember when I left Hedgewood in your charge with instructions to find a suitable tenant that I requested that neither you nor your tenant should enter the room with the red-paneled door. I now wish to emphasize that request and to remind you that you gave me your word of honor that my wishes in this respect would be obeyed to the letter. I am enclosing herewith the key to the room, to be placed with the others you have. You will give it to your prospective tenant with the same instructions you have received. It is unnecessary for me to explain why I do this, except to say that I expect you to use the same care in selecting a tenant as I trust I have shown in choosing an agent. It is a mere matter of honor, or the sure penalty that follows a breach of honor. Yours very truly, John Orland. Well, I said as I strung the key on the ring with the others, this is a nice bluebeard proposition to put up to a practical twentieth-century businessman. The old fellow is plumb crazy. It was while we were on the second floor, going from room to room and opening the windows, that I had my first view of the door with the red panels. Jim was close to it at the time. In fact, he had started for it when I called. You can't get in there, Jim. That door is locked. He continued, however, and, reaching the door, turned to the knob. I saw him twist his body and give a sudden wrench. He turned as I ran up with a puzzled look on his face. "'Try that knob, Dick,' he said. "'No use, Jim. The door is locked, and at any rate I have orders not to allow anyone in that room. It is Mr. Orland's private apartment.' "'Well, try the knob anyway,' he insisted. I took hold of the knob carelessly and gave it a slight turn. I dropped it and looked at Jim. His eyes had a queer look in them. "'What do you make of it?' "'Nonsense, Jim. Come away.' I took him by the arm and started with him down the hall. Dick, he said, stopping short, there is someone in that room. You're a crazy man. The knob is rusty from disuse. Now get busy. I'll go down and try again to get the boy and you start in to dust some of the furniture. We've got a big job in front of us if we want to get back before dark. I'd been gone about ten minutes and was returning with the boy, whom I had persuaded after some effort and a generous tip to help us in the house, when I heard a roar from Jim on the second floor. At the same instant, I noticed that the bunch of keys which I had left on the library table had disappeared. At Jim's cry, the boy with me ran down the steps and across the lawn, while I mounted to the second floor two steps at a time. My suspicions were verified, for, as I reached the landing, I saw Jim's figure pressed against the door with the red panels, which was partway open, and endeavoring vainly to crowd through the small aperture. I called to him sharply and ran hurriedly to pull him away, but suddenly he uttered a shriek of fear, and releasing his hold fell backward to the floor with a crash. And the partly opened door closed, too, and snapped shut. Jim sprang to his feet, and, with a cry of rage, threw the whole weight of his body against the heavy door. He was frantic with fury. I leaped upon him, and by sheer strength carried him, kicking and cursing, to the end of the hall, where I threw him upon a settee. "'There, you confounded chump!' I shouted. "'For two cents I'd punch your fat face in. "'What do you mean by disobeying my orders?' We glared at each other for a moment, and then a sheepish look crept into his face. Ah, "'I'm sorry, old man,' he said. 
but I was dead sure there was someone in there, and I wanted to find out who or what it was. Well, I hope you found out to your satisfaction, I sneered. Not to my satisfaction, no. But I found out that there is someone, or something, in that room. Jim, are you getting crazy, or is it just plain drunk? It's neither, Dick, and you know it. And you also know there is something on the other side of that door. And if you were half a man, you would help me find out what it is. I'm man enough to keep my word, and that, I hope, will be the final word on this subject. Your fool yelling has scared the boy into a panic, and I suppose we'll never see him again. With that, I marched him down to the main floor, where I started him to dusting the furniture, hoping that he would not forget the cobwebs in his brain. But I am free to confess that I cast more than one curious glance at the room with the red-paneled door. End of section two. Section three of Thrill Book, Volume One, Number Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Thrill Book, Volume One, Number Six. Crawling Hands by P. A. Connolly, Chapter Three. Avery's Promise. Before the inspection of the premises was half completed on the following day, Mrs. Avery declared enthusiastically in its favor. She was young and pretty and romantic, and the fine old place with its historical associations appealed strongly to her nature. On the way back to the machine, Jim detained me with a look. When we were out of hearing of the others, he turned to me impetuously. You're not going to rent that house to those people, he asserted. I am not. I asked, raising my eyebrows. No, you are not. Why, Jim? I asked softly. Because I won't have it, he declared. It would be criminal. Jim, said I, retaining my temper admirably. Since when did you acquire the right to dictate the policy of the firm? Damn the firm and you too. I say you will not allow that pretty young thing to live in this devilish place. It might mean her death, or worse. I stopped here last night. You? I demanded in amazement. How did you get in? Window, he announced. And did you get into the forbidden room? My anger was slowly rising to the boiling point. No, I did not, simply because I couldn't get in. I tried, I'll admit, and I guess I'm glad I didn't succeed. Now, Dick, see here. You just cool off and listen. I felt and heard things last night queer enough to convince me that that room is occupied by something that is not human. By what? I don't know what. I wish I did. You believe in the supernatural, Dick. Only you call it by some other name. This with a sneer. Put these people off for a week and let's investigate. It is worth the effort and it might save a tragedy. I can't, Jim, I said, somewhat impressed and considerably mollified by a serious manner. They have taken the place and are going to remain tonight and have their effects and servants come on from New York at once. Then said Jim with decision. I'll tell Mrs. Avery just exactly what has happened and scare her off. Jim, you're a fool, I retorted. Can't you see that Mrs. Avery is just the kind of a woman who would be delighted to have a ghost in the house? You just leave this to me. I'll tell Avery the whole affair and your suspicions and advise him to keep it from his wife. I'm bound to tell him about the room anyway and entrust him with a key. It will be a matter of honor with him, but judging from his looks, his curiosity won't get the better of it. I wouldn't say the same for his wife. Not that she isn't strictly honorable, you know, but a woman's curiosity. I shrugged my shoulders. By the way, Jim, I added, what did you see last night? Nothing. I felt and heard, he said. But I won't tell you what. You politely suggested yesterday that I was drunk or crazy, and I don't care to invite a second criticism of my habits or mentality. I'll simply say this. The danger or evil influence is confined to the one room. The rest of the house seems to be free from it. I left Jim brooding and rejoined the Averys, somewhat worried, I admit, and regretting the restrictions which prohibited me from entering the room. I had always taken a deep interest in all that pertained to the supernatural, but had never had any actual demonstration of its existence. All matters pertaining to the unknown or unseen life, or to life after death, held a strange interest for me, not that I was a spiritualist in any sense of the word, or 
at least not in the sense in which the term is generally understood. But I did believe that there were unseen forces, not human, constantly present and working among the children of men. That this influence or power worked for both good and evil, I had no doubt. What these forces were, whether they were human souls after transition to the spirit form and shackled for some unknown cause to the earth life, or the product of some other sphere, or whether they were purely demoniacal, I did not know, nor do I now. I simply know that they are, that they exist, and that they exert a constant influence upon mankind. That something out of the ordinary was amiss with the room with the red-paneled door, I had no doubt. Mr. Orland's peculiar attitude and conditions and the extraordinary effect made upon Jim, hard-headed, practical Jim, convinced me of this. But what was it? On some pretext, I got Mr. Avery away from his wife and told him all the circumstances. He looked annoyed at first and then anxiously at his wife. Finally, he burst into a hearty laugh. All right, he said. I'll accept the key and the secret, and will agree to keep both for my wife. I don't take a bit of stock in all this rot your friend has been telling you. At the same time, I know what effect this story and these conditions would have upon my wife, who is emotional and very romantic. Furthermore, I don't want anything to interfere with the pleasure of our honeymoon here. And when I left them, envious of their happiness and beautiful surroundings, I breathed a prayer that, if any sinister presence were in that house, they might not come under its baneful influence. End of section 3section 4 of Thrillbook volume 1 number 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by ben tucker thrillbook volume 1 number 6 crawling hands by p a connolly chapter 4 we force the door the summer passed uneventfully with no word from our tenants save the formal letters accompanying the monthly remittances then one morning, late in October, as Jim and I were preparing to make a visit of inspection to several properties, I was called to the telephone. And in answer to my response, a voice which, in spite of the tremor and excitement in it I recognized as Avery's, asked me to come immediately to Hedgewood. It was not until we were in the car that I told Jim, who was driving, to head for Orland's place and put on all speed. "'What's the trouble?' he asked, obeying my wishes but taking time to cast a curious glance at me. I don't know. Avery telephoned me to come quick on a matter of great importance. It was only good fortune that kept Jim from arrest for breaking the speed law. Twenty minutes later we drew up in front of the gate at Hedgewood. Avery was there to meet us. His face was pale and his eyes had in them a look of horror. What's the matter? I demanded as he jumped into the car and we drove to the house. Brooks is dead. Murdered, I think. Who is Brooks? My brother-in-law, he came last week to spend a few days with us, and... Was he in the secret room? I demanded. He flushed and stammered. Yes, yes. I told him the story and showed him the key, but put him on his honor not to use it. I didn't think he'd do it. But it seems he was interested in that sort of thing, and... and... His voice trailed off, then suddenly rose, and he turned on me in a fit of fury. What the devil do you mean by putting us in a house like that? He snarled. What devilish thing have you got in that room? It might have been my wife. My wife, do you hear? He stood over me with distorted face and threatening gesture. Sit down, I commanded coldly. I told you the conditions. I know nothing of the room other than that which you know. Where is your brother-in-law? He sank back in the tonneau, his face twitching nervously while the car drove slowly toward the house. He is still in the room, he whispered with a shudder. And I can't get him out. Can't? No, I am not a coward, but I dare not go into that room. I tried once, and... and... He buried his face in his hands. Jim turned and looked at me queerly. I know why I can't go in, he said. The thing that's in there won't let him. By this time we had reached the front porch. Where's your wife, Avery? I asked, laying my hand on his shoulder. He looked up haggardly. My wife? He asked vacantly. My wife? Yes, my wife. Thank God she is safe. She is visiting in town and knows nothing of this. Jim had shut off the power and darted to the front door. I followed closely with Avery behind me. In this order we ran, leaped rather, up the broad staircase and down the upper hall. 
Breathless, we paused at the room with the red door panels. The door was tightly closed, but the key was in the lock. Jim grasped the knob and turned the key. We all heard the bolt shoot sharply back. With all his strength, he threw the full weight of his body against the door, but it resisted all his efforts. Forgetting Mr. Orlon's instructions, forgetting my word of honor, I, too, added my strength to Jim's, and slowly, slowly, the door yielded. Distinctly, I felt the pressure of a resisting force on the other side. Then suddenly, when the door was half open, I heard a horrid, half-strangled shriek from Jim, and at the same moment felt a cold, clammy hand at my throat. An enormous hand. The fingers reached round and met at the back of my neck. When I came to, I found Jim and Mr. Avery bending anxiously over me. I sat up, and instinctively my hand went to my throat. A dull ache persisted there. Did you see anything when Jim and I forced the door? Jim looked puzzled. No, I can't say positively. I thought just before you screamed that I saw a pair of enormous hands shoot out from the doorway and clasp each of you by the throat. Avery broke in. Circumstances alter cases and vitiate promises sometimes, and besides, a plain duty lay before me. There is a dead body of a man on the other side of that door, and he must be gotten out. How do you know he is dead? The thought suggested the question. Avery was still under strong nervous excitement. I was partway in the room before my throat was clutched. I saw his body on the bed, his head hanging over the side, his mouth open, and eyes staring. He was dead. A convulsive shudder shook him as he recalled the picture. Gentlemen, I said, we have got to get the body out. I turned to Jim, and you and I will solve the mystery. I'm with you, Jim's lower jaw clenched. If this is the work of human beings, which I strongly suspect, the matter will be comparatively simple, although more dangerous. If it is of supernatural agency, it may not be so easy. Let me say to start with, gentlemen, that I believe in the supernatural. I believe there are unseen forces about us with power, at times, to inflict harm upon human beings. This may be one of the times. The only way to counteract or overcome the power of one of the beings of the outer circle is by an absolute freedom from fear. A brave front alone will not do. There must positively be no shadow of fear in your heart. Do you understand, Jim? Yes, he said, and I saw by the look on his face that he meant it. And you, Avery. He was sitting with his face in his hands, his whole attitude one of utter misery. I'm not up to it, boys, he muttered without looking up. Then you go down to the lower floor, or better still, go out into the grounds. The air will do you good. We'll join you presently. Jim, I said in a low tone when Avery had shuffled down the stairs. We will put this in the form of a test. If there is a man in that room, we will meet with the same powerful resistance when we attempt to enter. If it is not a man, if the force in there is of supernatural origin, there will be little, if any, opposition, so long as we show that we are entirely unafraid. Do you understand? He nodded impatiently. Jim had been a famous football player in the old college days, and I knew him to be a man of undaunted physical courage. I could not ask for a better companion in any venture requiring cool nerve and daring. Together we approached the door, and this time it was my hands that grasped the knob and key. Jim, you have no fear. I asserted it as a fact. No. Nor have I. Come. To be concluded. End of section four. Section 5, The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by LibVox53. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. The Devil's Own by Chester L. Saxby. Chapter 4. Synopsis of Preceding Chapters Malin, a young man, ships aboard a ship, commanded by Hevel Hogarth. He soon finds that Hogarth is a man of evil ways, and is looking for the man who robbed him of the woman he loved and mistreated. Hogarth is planning a terrible revenge. Part 2 opens up with the meeting of Hogarth and the woman. 
Malin is puzzled about her innocence, but already he is thoroughly aroused over the brutality of the ship's captain. Chapter 4 The woman before me, the man not fifty feet off in another room, and I the unwilling confidant of both. Here was a pretty turn of affairs. Fate was drawing me into hot water with a vengeance. A bestial man in peace, and the devil's own in fury. That was Hogarth, and I had small compassion for him. But here sat the woman who had wrapped his animal love about her, only to throw it off as a worn garment. A golden woman with a heart and soul of fickle flame. She was shaking with abject fear, but why should compassion urge me to protect her? As she had sowed, so had she reaped, and the judgment seemed near at hand, too near for my own comfort. Hevel Hogarth comes to find the woman Lorraine and a bearded man who robbed him of her, I bluntly informed her. Where is the man with you? Signor, Signor, swear to heaven that you will help me. What you say only frightens me more. Hevel has told lies to you, Signor. He told you it is love. And Giffirth, he can do nothing against Hevel. I am alone. You look honest and manly, Signor. I overlooked the compliment. I wished to get at the bottom of things. He has deserted you so soon? Has he run from Hogarth? No, no, he is here, but Hevel would break him, bone and body. Giffreth is no match for him. You are big and strong. You are of Hevel's ship? I am a mate to him by the lore of gold, I frankly admitted. But I wish you no harm, madam, though it seems I can't help you. You play a heavy game. I would not be in your place, nor in the place of Giffreth Bartold. He is an ogre, she said and I knew she meant Hogarth. He has told you he loved me. He used that lie once before, but he wants no love, only what he calls revenge. Giffreth offered me riches and all that a woman craves, life. I love him not much, but he is honorable, and I have decided to go with him. Will you take Hevel from here and let us escape? I ask no more, and... And you are kind, Signor. I was never called so, I grimaced. Yet I dislike bloodletting, and perhaps worse than that is in Hogarth's mind. I will be gone and say nothing, so that he will have no suspicion of your being here. But I warn you to leave Cadiz at once. I got up and strode toward the door. My eyes turned for a glance at her there and her warm beauty forced the blood galloping through my veins. I left her unwilling and started through the doorway, when a figure loomed ahead, and I saw that it was Hogarth. "'What the devil keeps you?' he began. My face must have revealed something of what I strained to conceal. "'A. Eh, who is there with you?' "'There is none with me,' I blurted. "'I am ready now. Where do we go?' Not so fast, he growled. If you are lying to me, it's an unprofitable business. Let me by. I'll have a look to satisfy myself. My feet blocked the passage. He put out his hand to thrust me aside, but I resisted and tried to turn him, mumbling that we must hurry and that he was mad to be aroused over nothing. With a snarl, he exerted his strength and flung me to the wall. I regained my balance, and hot with dread of the inevitable, rushed after him. He had stopped just inside the door and was staring straight ahead. A woman's scream came, short and stifled, and a man's laugh, equally short and hollow. Hogarth had found his prey. Then the woman's voice broke coherently on the silence, sobbing as she spoke. Hevel, have I no right to go where I will?' What do you want with me? As he moved nearer to her, I was able to re-enter the room. Watching and waiting, I stood, and well I knew that Hogarth felt me at his back. Where is Bartold? he asked her. His voice was husky, thick as the voice of a man in drink. Where is the fool who exacts no promises? How do I know, Hevel? cried out the woman. I owe you nothing, and you can claim nothing. 
Have you come to do me harm? I never wished you harm. I saw his lips twist at this. He was regarding her evenly, expressionlessly. He seemed a cat watching a mouse, ready to spring, yet staying his eager pounce. I am not looking for you, he said, but for Gifford Bartold. Tell me if he is here. Tell me where he is. We have something to talk about, he and I. Her lips were closed, I thought, over chattering teeth. Faint with fear of him, she was forced by moral weakness to do what she willed not to do. Then leave me, Hevel. Go, she said hysterically. Gifford is up. He is upstairs. Oh, what is it you want? Hevel, say that you mean him no harm. Say it to me. You will not go to him in an evil temper. But Hogarth laughed aloud unmusically and willed to me in evident consciousness of my presence she is a pretty bird eh malin a pretty bird and no mistake but there is no faith in birds i leave her to your tender mercies i have business upstairs be tender if you will but a beautiful bird must not flutter away see to it with these words he flung about and would have left us where we stood the woman and myself but she broke from her cowering attitude and launched toward him, grasping him by the arm and calling, Hevel, Hevel, no, no, not that way, not that way. Tell me, swear. Her jerked cry was halted by his brutal arm that whipped out to fling her from him. He drew away from her huddled form, lying where it had fallen on the floor. I'll not be touched. Your fingers burn me. Keep away. He made for the door, raging of eyes, red flamed of cheeks, and I pictured his inward raging in a yet darker hue. He vanished like a tongue of fire. Senor, senor, stop him. Oh, Jesus of Mary, he goes to kill. Stop him anyway, but be quick. Do you stand there? She was stark with fright. Madam, I told her, a man must fight for himself. I do not envy rushing into this affair hot-handed. Somehow I trust to help you. I cannot thank you. For me, for me, she implored. That is later, but give earth now. You will not go? Then I... She plucked up her skirts and ran to the door, choking with her emotions, darted through the passage, and was gone. Aroused to the possibility of her finding Hogarth, I sprang after her and led by her light footsteps, gained the stairs. They were deserted, but I could hear her pressing through the hall above, and I paused not a second to think. Down the corridor her nimble figure was disappearing swiftly. I put on speed and lessened the distance betwixt us. She was before a door. She had opened it and was out of sight. I arrived at the door and found it wide, from deep in the room into which it gave came spasmodic issuings of a man's voice. The next moment I was face to face with the bearded man, who looked with manifest surprise from me to the woman in the middle of the room, and from the woman back to me. Gifforth, the woman answered his look, Hevel is searching for you. He is here. Here. You must hide, do you hear? Be quick. He has missed the room. Hevel, murmured Bartold, and the hollowness of his tone smote on my ears like the note of a funeral dirge. You have seen him, Lorraine? He is here, here in the hallway. Gifforth, don't ask questions. Hide, hide. A back stairway. No use to lock the door. Leave this place. Get as far away as possible. I will find you somehow. Gifforth, why do you not move? For he was seemingly unminded to accept her advice to flee, and was regarding her, not in a stricken stupor, but after the one pronouncing of Hogarth's name, seriously and collectedly. In that instance of observing him, I felt a frank admiration go out to him. He stopped the woman's riotous pleading to wave to me. Who is this gentleman? he asked quietly. Is he of Hevel's company? Yes, yes, she hastened, but he has no love for him. 
you will not tell where you have gone to talk will ruin you giffarth hurry away but i am not going lorraine he soberly stated would i leave you here for that fellow lorraine am i such a coward then the intenseness of his gaze might have been caused by the predicament he was in but the odd smile that lighted all his face disproved that the rebuke of his voice so he loved her that much she shivered her eyes devouring him her breath going and coming fast not going but you are no match for him he is a wolf for strength i know his strength asserted bartold perhaps he will not find us here if this gentleman is friendly we will do what we can not so loud lorraine my love but she was not to be frustrated her hand leaped out to grasp his wrist i will go come we will both go it must be the rear stairs or he will discover us come she was urging him to the door down to the kitchen and then into the alley where are many speech ceased while her gaze was on him she was backing toward the door and the look in his eyes as he gazed past her froze the words in her mouth as she turned i turned and stood dumb hogarth bestrode the entrance showing the effect of hard running but except for his hectic color and heavy breathing he was outwardly calm gifferth bartold he uttered ominously gifferth bartold good i am here hevel hogarth returned bartold what do you want of me i want nothing of you gifford bartold that i can't take with my two hands you fool you miserable treacherous fool go back you can't go this way the woman's face was pasty white gently with a huge sigh which seemed to bear away her spirit she slipped down and lay motionless at bartold's feet my own legs turned weak for i had known hogarth's craving for this hour bartold exhibited no fear but a sort of woe-begone grimness as he obeyed and backed slowly into the wide space at the centre of the room you won't forget the woman is here hevel that was all no word of right or wrong no hint of asking quarter no cringing or protesting of innocence if ever i had felt under hogarth's raging that this man was a hound of deceit i forgot it now i don't ever forget the woman responded hogarth's sickening voice i don't forget anything she'll have to see what she brought on us you malin watch her till this thing is done i give you the chase i take gifferth i give a babbling informer the use of his hands but i'm going to close your mouth he pulled the door to behind him turned the key and thrust it into his pocket now say what you've got to say gifferth bartold i'm fair with every man whether he's a man or a skunk there is nothing a man could say to you hevel hogarth replied bartold his eyes were upon the woman's form seeing which i knelt and straightened her and chafed her hands she sighed and opened her eyes chill with horror i played you no wrong you don't care to hear that what is your mind hevel hogarth what's my mind hogarth moved toward him with a movement neither swift nor slow of a jungle creature stalking his prey what's my mind in a lurching motion of his long and terrible arms he had gripped bartold about the head and right arm a rough and fiendish trick learned perhaps of an oriental and was bending both with a suddenly charged fury the woman had turned her face and was watching with fevered vision but i saw that the faintness had left her and so i straightened the better to keep hogarth within my observation the uncouth ship's master was gathering a devastating storm of rage that was likely to consume whatever lay in his path. I had witnessed more than one moment of his diabolical temper. I witnessed now the most brutal of his passionate moments. He was utterly the slave of undisciplined wrath that destroyed in white heat. 
His face partook of a distorting animosity. His coarse lips overlapped, the lower over the upper. His head forced down in the outbearing of his arms and shoulders, obliterated his squat neck. A madman he was, and a creature of primeval savageness. And close to that repugnant visage gazed the haunted eyes of Bartold, not at the oncoming terror, but across and down, fairly into the congealed expression of the woman. He seemed most concerned with the unholy thought of her witnessing his accepted misfortune. With his lips fading in hue to a bloodless gray, he spoke to her over Hogarth's swaying shoulder. Lorraine, go away, go away, get into the closet, turn your back. Giffirth, her answering cry rang out, Giffirth, fight, you must. The fault is mine. Fight, oh, your face, he is killing you. Hevel, here am I, see? But Hogarth gave her no attention except a blighting oath and dug in his nails the harder. Setting his feet against the strain, grunting and mumbling, inchoate sounds that ceased only when he drew in his breath. And Bartold's hot pain at last rose in a lingering groan, making even my hardened stomach lift in the sickness of it. However, it was the woman's look that determined me. I acted without thought and strode to Hogarth, wrenching at his torturing arm and calling on him to stop his cruelty. The tenacious fingers were not loosed from Bartold's head and wrist as he writhed free of my detaining hands. Back with you, Malin, out of this now, made of the brig six dollars. He bore down as he spoke. Bartold's face was glistening with perspiration issuing into his forehead in great round drops. His groans quavered in the stillness, then were checked in the violent grinding of his teeth. The man in him was surging up to give battle. Self-preservation was gaining possession of him. End of Section 5section six the thrill book volume one number six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by libvox 53 the thrill book volume one number six the devil's own by chester l saxby chapter five I would gladly shut the eyes of my memory and relate nothing of what happened further. I would spare the chronicling of distasteful detail and suffice myself with stating the outcome alone. But that would be to tell only half the truth, and I am resolved to rid my heart of the whole accursed matter. I have said that this is not a nice tale, and I cannot shirk one particle of the shameful matter. Bartold had been almost pliant in Hogarth's grasp, but now he was fighting, grim battle in his glare that was already glassy with suffering. His left arm went out and pressed against Hogarth's temple, succeeded in bending back the heavy jowl, yet in the next instant had lost its purchase, and slowly Hogarth's stubbled face resumed its forward listing. Failing here, Bartold drew back his fist and sent it, hammering again and again to the unprotected boldness of jaw. Oh, he was weak, weak as I had been to make an impression on that granite feature. The dull blows beat, 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 until for very weakness they seized, and Bartold's legs crumbled beneath him. Down he went, Hogarth over him, the jar of their fall breaking his hold. They writhed together, heads cracking on each other, arms interlocked, feet flailing. A gurgling protest went up from the two, a suffocated entreaty of pent breath. Hogarth's hands had found Bartold's throat and were cutting off his wind. The woman close to me beat her hands against her breasts and made spasmodic moans. I saw her eyes roll upward in prayer, she was a golden woman no longer. She was gray. 
At that, I spat out some articulation and launched upon Hogarth's body where it lay uppermost. I attacked him with aimless hands, tearing at his shoulders, cursing him, kicking him, fastening to him, and writhing when he writhed. It was weird. It was primordial. It was ghastly with depravity. Hogarth's voice bellowed commands, but I cared not for that. I cared not for anything but the ending of this unwholesome lust after a man's life. His threshing head moved aside. Bartold's face was revealed to me, blood-filled, darkening moment by moment. I knew what this meant, and I swerved my attack to squeeze in betwixt them, jerking at Hogarth's set fingers, elbowing back his ruthless arms. Like the darting of a lightning bolt, one of his hands broke loose and twisted about my neck. A blackness yawned about me as my neck was turned in the irresistible vice of his crooked arm. There was a minute of excruciating suffering. I could neither cry out nor hold at bay the thousand points that stabbed my spine. The minute ended. I fell clear of the two and lay in half-awake lethargy. Gradually this lifted. I pulled myself up to lean against the bed. The fog cleared before me, and there were the two, partially rising, Hogarth on his knees, Bartold held in his mighty hands, the poor fellow's stricken fingers wrapping limply on the floor. Then Hogarth flung him at arm's length from him. I blinked and fought off the lethargy, stumbling to my knees, thence to my feet. I went toward them, but even as I stretched out my hands, the thing was over. The appalling climax was reached. Bartold lay still. The whole room was plunged into intense quiet that vibrated to the humming of my pulse. Hogarth, tipping on unsure legs, stood watching. The eyes of the dying man gyrated in their sockets with the fight for air. Bartold raised himself and showed a blackened visage swollen temples and a tongue hanging loosely from his mouth and from this mouth came three words lorraine the voice was thick he was searching but it was plain that he could not see graf one arm pointed laxly upward god he sagged down and groveled with his face to the coarse boards a shudder then all motion ceased my eyes strayed from the miserable heap to where the woman had stood. I was prepared to discover her in a dead faint from the horror of it all. But she was crouching in the corner, and in her wide eyes, far too conscious of her surroundings, burned a more vivid and wilder light of personal fear. She was chafed to awareness by the fate of her consort in guilt, if guilt it could be called, and this I began seriously to doubt. There followed the dread thought that if there existed in this man and this woman no guilt, what a crime too great for punishment had just transpired. Was it not an underlying compassion for the solitary figure that had kept me thus far in thy rather detached companionship for Hogarth? But now that emotion was utterly smudged by his brutal ruthlessness, by his inhumane behavior. A man lay murdered, close at hand, murdered by an unreasoning and totally bestial temper. I hated this criminal. Hogarth let his gaze rove at will through the room. For a passing second it was on me, and I know that my spirit congealed with dread of it, and as quickly flamed white-hot with defensive anger. But Hogarth had no thought for me. His eyes glared at length, straight on the face of the woman, who— as though finding, in this fierceness of gaze, a surfeit of her enormous fear, breathed a heavy sigh, and, supported by the wall, got to her feet and faced him. In the ashes of her dead-colored cheeks, the fire was rekindling. She even spoke to him in a mounting voice. Is he dead, Hevel Hogarth, if that is still your name? Have you killed him? She waited in a stark silence for the reply while Hogarth continued to contemplate her, as if her question had failed to reach his ears. But slowly his gaze fought clear of her and back to that silent form on the floor. 
He dropped his eyes to his hands, spread like talons that, having destroyed, widened again with their appetite. He's as dead as I meant him to be, he ventured in a normal tone. His lying tongue is still now. His dilated eyes belied his even voice. He didn't lie to you nor to anyone, rose the woman's frantic voice. But you killed him. He's dead. Hogarth bent his gaze once more on her. He's dead, he's dead, and he loved me. Then seeing Hogarth's wolfish look, What do you want, Hevel? There's innocent blood on your hands. What do you want with me? Shut up, spat Hogarth in a recurring fury. Gifford Bartold used his mouth too freely, but he played against his luck when he tried to cross Hevel Hogarth. But he plays no more, luck or no luck, for you. He swung about so violently that I felt myself crouch to meet the spring that should bring him upon the woman. He only glared at her at his distance. Without ending his thought, he crossed to the door. Unlocking it, he held it open. Come, Malin, he growled, frowning, it seemed, to hide his physical weariness. We'll get out of this. I went to the door, and the woman followed me, keeping close. I strode over the sill. She would have done likewise, but he pushed her back roughly and slammed the door to, thrust the key into the lock, and turned it. I grasped his arm, and he stared back without vindictiveness. The key he replaced in his pocket. She's safer there, he explained, and she'll raise no noise with the look of murder in the room to be laid to her account. For God's sake, come. It's got me. I must have tonic in my veins. His breath in my lungs. Ugh. Mr. Malan, there's work to be done. Hurry. There's foul work done already, I answered him. That man... Is it worth murder to love a woman that another man loves? He appeared stupefied and frowned to discover reason in my utterance. Love a woman? Who said I loved? Oh, eh. He checked himself clumsily and fell to parrying. Does a man yield all without a battle? The woman was mine, and I will have her. I'm within my rights, Malin. What? You'll make her go with you? You love her now? Bah! You'll have me believing you. What will you do with her? I will know that. But he grasped my wrist and pulled me on with him, and no word more would he utter until we fell in into seats at the inn's private table. I was holding down the struggling fear of Hogarth's crime, being apprehended and all of us thrust before a hot-blooded Spanish tribunal, and so I cast calculating eyes upon the individual who answered Hogarth's hoarse demand for whiskey, or I had taken greater thought for the seeming inconsistency of this teetling ship's master's sudden desire for alcohol. The servant was stupid, and besides but half awake, and by his lackluster expression, it was at once evident that no sound of the late death grapple had come down to those below. For this I thanked God and set to watching Hogarth pour out huge glassfuls of the vilest and strongest rum and gulp it off as if it were the weakest water. I drank nothing. I could not have swallowed milk. Ah, ah, aspired Hogarth. This rank stuff burns down and stops the last strength from leaving me. I must think, and this will clear my brain. There is none about. Look carefully, Mal Mr. Malin. We are alone in the room. Eh, hey, so far, you're born to luck, I said in a morbid challenge. And for that other, since the one is gone, I would know your intent. His eyes glinted fire in the blackness of them. He showed no resentment for my manner. Another great measure of the deadly liquor was poured down his throat. For the other, he said slowly, there is the reward of her duplicity. I will not kill her, Malin. No, no, I can't do that. Could I strike her? I would, but I loved her once, and my hands shrink and sicken at the thought of touching her body with worse than love the purpose. He raised the jug and refilled his glass. I marveled at the capacity and withstanding power of the man. Then how may justice be paid off? Give me your counsel, Malin. 
Advise me, mate. What's to be done? There's a quick retreat to be made, I sharply reminded him. After murder comes the law, and my head would go with yours if we were discovered. Do you hear that? Will you sit here when time is approaching to hem us in? I leaned forward and thrust each word at him, for his attention was lasping to a mere shadow of interest. Fading was the glitter of his usually hypnotic gaze, fading fast like the wilting of a plucked flower in the hot sunlight. Over his eyes was drawing a film of preoccupation. His mind was wallowing in fair slows of the past, I thought, or the grim whiskey was doing its work. When he lifted his hand and the glass in it to his lips, hand and glass trembled in indecision, and the whiskey splashed down on the table. He laughed at that as a silly half-grown child laughs at his own puerile weakness of movement or error of judgment. He was the masterful, quick-witted Hogarth no longer. He was pushed down and conquered by the stronger demon of the jug. The damn thing slipped, he sniggered sheepishly. I had it tight, but it jumped out. Good stuff, though. Better than the whiskey they give you in Chicago. He halted his tongue at sound of it and essayed to control himself. I almost fancied that he displayed fear for just an instant, but the instant was gone, and he downed the drink. A prodigious yawn attested to his condition. Hogarth! Hogarth! I bawled close to his ear. Sit up! Settle this thing! Listen! The woman will cry out in that room upstairs and bring help! We will be surprised and taken, you filthy hog. I suddenly finished and tore the glass from his grasp. He looked over at me with a frown and reached for the glass. Don't talk damn foolishness, Malin, he attempted to reason without much vigor. Just one more drink. I'm burning up. One more drink and I'll listen. The change in him nonplussed me more than I can describe. The form of him was unreal. The wine in his voice astonished me utterly. I stared and wondered, and more through unconsciousness of what I was doing than through purpose, surrendered the glass. I watched him lift the jug and spill the whiskey on the table, and in his lap, in a sightless effort to refill the glass. Giffreth won't bother us. Giffreth Bartold, he won't talk any more. He's dead, he rambled as he occupied himself. Leave it to me. Didn't I get him? Eh? If they knew in Chicago that I got him, got him like I said I would. He wouldn't let me be, don't you see, Malin? Don't be hard on me. I had to do it. It was his own fault. Why'd he tell on me? That's gospel, Malin. He squealed, and he's dead. You saw him, didn't you? His tongue's hanging out for air. Let him try. He can't find air in hell. What makes it so hot, Malin? I rose and shook him tensely, mad with disgust. Get out of this, I growled. What will it be for the woman? Answer me that. The brig's waiting, and her maid is for pulling out of this. Unless you act now, I'm for letting this woman go and getting aboard the brig for quick sailing. I spoke harshly and succeeded in partially waking him. Shh, he cautioned me. Listen, mate. We'll carry her to the brig and up sail for some waste coast. Hold the glass still. It jumps so I can't run the stuff into it. Not with my hands will I do her hurt, but her mouth won't rave and draw me to what I've tasted before. What say, mate? Maroon her. You devil's cur, I reviled in his evil grinning. It'll be murder first and not hers either. She's her own mistress. She can talk of what she likes. Easy, mate. She talks of me, and so did Giffreth Bartold. He's dead. He squealed, and I did for him. There's only Lorraine stands between me and an innocent life. Nobody can know but you and me. The hands, I'll shoot down the man that Caesar brought aboard, but they won't see her, not a mother's son of them. While he spoke, there ran through my mind most vividly only the ambiguous mention of Chicago and Gifford Bartold's too great talk and of hers. What did he mean? How did their talk concern him? There was but their flight, and that had been frustrated by a swift and terrible retribution. Above us, the man was lying even now. 
how he lay and what that crazed woman must every moment look upon iced my spine and now chicago half the world separated us from chicago and i had found him further yet had he known a different life from cruising among palm-beached waters of a tropical wilderness an american he was his speech his manner it was not a far call to the next thought for that thought lay gnawing in my brain for explanation he sat staring straight before him his eyes closing beneath the pressure of weariness and whiskey deeper and deeper he was settling into his chair i bit my lip and clenched my hands in preparation for what my effort might bring arthur graff i hissed an experiment arthur graff they're coming like a dash of northern water full in the face the sharp words worked a miracle in the man's dozing his eyes snapped wide open likewise his mouth and he jerked erect babbling a maudlin protest that shivered through the stillness of that hot room he shot inquiring glances to every side and swung his gaze upon me where where are they did you see how many who's coming i thought i heard them outside i evaded will they know you graff his hands stroked his face and tumbled his hair at his chin they paused i shaved it off he laughed in an abandon that was born of the whiskey they never saw hevel hogarth arthur graff is dead died at sea whole ship went down but the woman knows arthur graff i pressed him relying on my only worthwhile conjecture the woman graff think will she tell them hollowly he glared in return cudgeling his slow wits for the key to the situation it seemed finally he found it and showed his teeth she's locked in that room gifford is there with her no he'll never tell anything and i have the keeping of her he dug deep into his pocket and brought up the door key at this he stared a while in unsound reflection a she would tell if she could a a damn her she did tell and arthur graff had to drown himself with the whole ship's company off the bahamas she told do you hear she never loved me and she told she'll never tell again he started up in consternation what's that noise are they here did you see them malin not now but there's no time to waste she told on you did she she went to the police and gave up did she and why did she do it graff why did you do it i was leading him on as i might for a moment he regarded me with determined dislike for my inquisitiveness but this faded into a nod i'll tell you malin why did i do it his blear eyes were utterly weary money eh that's what i was after money heaps of it all for the moving of my fingers he checked himself and batted his eyelids but arthur graff's dead and a whole ship's crew with him died at sea in a storm but you killed bartold he didn't know i urged he didn't know didn't know he mused dreamily a he knew more than she did he knew about the the other things she told but it was giffarth told her god i got him i know what i'm saying they told me in kakaman two months ago old joe he told me i heard it from his mouth and old joe he got it straight he never trusted giffarth bartold he hated him like i did giffarth double-crossed me and lorraine never trust a woman mate they're all alike they're crooked and black she told you they were running away she wrote to you to say that huh she wrote to me what the devil are you driving at the mystification in his face was genuine he was jerking to keep erect don't you remember i tapped him on the arm and spoke slowly and clearly he strove against the overwhelming desire to sleep and listened you showed me a letter from her from lorraine she told you she was going with a man who exacted no promises she said she was through with you she said she wouldn't wait a light of understanding broke over his face he laughed drunkenly she never wrote me a letter i wrote that i wrote it to you mate and you answered it it was a joke on you malin a damn good joke 
The anger that rose in me choked my throat. I had been hoodwinked then. He had lied to me, and perhaps he was lying now. I would find out that and more. A fine joke. Ha, ha. I counterfeited as best I could for the blind passion that billowed through my blood. And you never loved her at all, eh? Ha, ha. Don't remember, he mumbled, shaking his drooping head. It's a long time ago. I fooled you, Malin, all right. You thought I was lovesick and I wanted her. His head slipped lower and lower and his eyes flapped shut and open, but still the anger growled in his mouth. I wanted her heart anyway, mate. A, it was her heart. That last word came through closed lips. His head sank to his shoulder. He was sound asleep and snoring. End of section six. Section seven of The Thrill Book, Volume One, Number Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by LibVox 53. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. The Devil's Own by Chester L. Saxby. Chapter 6. I sat a while stupidly summing it up. No wonder he had not wanted whiskey brought aboard the brig. The game he played was a shrewd one. He needed his faculties. He had fooled me, and why? He had lied to me of the reason for following the woman. Here in Cadiz he admitted it. He had brought me here, had held me to him when I wished, nothing better than to be rid of him. He had insisted that these affairs concerned me as well as him. Then he was determined, evidently, that I should have a part to play. He was not paying his mate a captain's price for ship duty alone. And for what other reason would he overlook my insubordination and my late attempt to halt his murderous strength against Giffreth Bartold? But what was to be done that he in his individual power could not accomplish? Had it to do with this woman? With Hogarth's drunken form slouched in its chair across the table from me, I found almost my first opportunity for uninterrupted contemplation of my predicament. For days, a for weeks now, I had been satisfied in an indifferent way to let hour follow hour, and had given little enough care to the chain of events which so grievously affected the stupor-quieted fiend with whom I had signed for devil's pay, and I saw more clearly devil's work. True, I had grumbled at his insistent demands that I know his misfortune, and I had observed and noted and clapped away for future reference his looks, his strange manners, his moods, but this was all by the way. Of personal moment there had appeared nothing. Now as I conned over the day's incidents, one upon another, the seeming carelessness was not lost to me. I saw the planned reason for signing me to the voyage to Cambella, for increasing my pay to a munificent six dollars a day, for keeping me within easy reach, and for bringing me ashore, and at last for drawing me out of that room of death where the woman might otherwise work a hurtful change in my superficial allegiance to him. I was here for a purpose, and that purpose was unveiling itself. I thought I saw at last. First, then, Hogarth had lied to me of his inability to write. Also, he had deliberately deceived me as to the letter from the woman, and in his unguarded drunkenness had admitted his authorship of it. This partially explained the concealment of his penmanship. He would otherwise have exposed the writing in the letter. But to my new enlightenment there was a larger reason. What he hid from me, he was hiding from the whole world, because he was Arthur Graff, convicted of the crime of forgery. With this knowledge came another more gruesome shaft of light. His statement concerning the woman's former love for him was likewise a cold and malicious lie. But why did he trouble himself to lie thus 
at length and in particulars only i surmised to rouse my sympathy and transplant in my heart the hatred of the woman that existed in his then he was preparing me for something for some definite function in his revenge and this in spite of the fact that half his revenge had been effected without assistance somehow those guerrilla arms which had so easily crushed out the nowise puny life of the man were not effective enough to exterminate the woman sudden inspiration fed my probing mind if it was not physical power he lacked was it mental or moral had a former passion for this woman rendered him powerless to wreak his desire his words i recalled to help me there's only lorraine stands between me and an honest life not with my hands will i do her hurt but her mouth won't rave and draw me to what i've tasted before and i knew that hevel hogarth whom no man had been able to call coward was coward before a woman he had talked of marooning and i scoffed at the remoteness of the plan there was too much risk of a lost soul turning up again i felt sure that even in his drunkenness he had essayed to trick me again that he would not divulge the real plan because i was deeply mixed in it heavily it came to me that i not he was to be the actual murderer well we would see as to that he had measured me a reckless daredevil money-loving rogue and so i was but i was not a criminal armed with this solution i cautiously rose from my chair and proceeded to advantage myself of his helpless plight without disturbing his heavy breathing i put my hand into his pocket and helped myself to the door key of that room upstairs on tiptoe i made from the dining room and to the threshold that had been crossed by death fearfully i unlocked the door stepped within and swiftly closed it the room was in the same disorder past the high-posted bed still awkwardly sprawled the lurid pantomime of death the scarecrow twist of body with outflung arms the purpled face distorted and staring the jaws agape and the lips black i had to glance twice before i made out the woman sitting in the far corner sitting immobile her eyes glued to the horrible thing at her feet charmed no doubt by its impelling clownishness even when i stood fairly at her side she failed to apprehend my presence it was not until i spoke that she moved madam i have come to help you she did not unleash her agonized gaze from that lifeless thing she did not start nor did she utter a single exclamation as she had been sitting so she held herself rigidly every muscle frozen but her body stiffly bore to the right and silently fell to the floor i hurried to pick her up and carried her to the bed there i chafed her hands loosened her clothes somewhat and poured some water over her white face she responded slowly so that for a time i dreaded that she had died of fright but she opened her clenched hands and let the blood come back into them she sighed and vacantly inspected me recognition brought renewed terror senor senor take it out of my eyes his face jesus mary his face black oh so black let me die let me die where is that devil below drunk i tersely explained and began carefully madam try to be quiet and listen to me to help you i must know certain things yes yes i will try but ah oh, senor his face how black no no i will listen what shall i tell you senor take me away what other name had hogarth madam how else do you know him name ah oh, yes his name was not hevel hogarth but arthur graff i swore i would never speak that name aloud but he has murdered gifforth and next he will kill me in america he was arthur graff senor will you take me away you knew him there 
madam you knew him for a forger and betrayed him to the police and he once loved you tell me that her stare was blank with innocence had hogarth lied about this too i betray him senor what are you saying i loathed him always but i would not betray him i met him on the sea he made evil love to me senor Gifforth never did that he loved me his face oh his face Gifforth told me when i married him about the other things i had known of the forging but i kept silent Gifforth married you i felt myself echo you were his wife the damned hypocrite the foul liar senor she cried wildly Gifforth never lied and he was good to me i mean hogarth i roughly replied swear that you not once mentioned graf's crimes swear on what is sacred to you madam swear be quick yes senor by the holy virgin mary i swear it you believe me senor ay i hoarsely answered her i believe you but why did you run before him what had you to fear ah it was for bartold's sake bartold told did he Gifforth told nothing senor but that brute laid it to him that was all what hogarth killed bartold without knowing impossible it has been so before senor other men Gifforth told me of them my revolting senses were at the breaking point with this information i saw that hogarth had taken rumor for his guide and surely matters had gone well for his wily scheme ignorance and innocence were being stalked by cold savagery i cast a rapid glance over the room avoiding what lay on the floor can you walk madam you have no choice but to hide until we are gone after that i wondered what was left for her afterward she sought to rise but immediately fell back and a look of consternation reappeared in her eyes her weakness alarmed her i could see the delicate lines of white brow and warm mouth were indented with furrows but she was speechless as gently as i might for i was unused to the handling of gentle women i raised her in my arms and strode to the door anywhere was more free from danger than here where hogarth might wander when the power of the whiskey had subsided i came with her into the hallway which was palely alight with the late morning sun steaming through the thick dust of a high casement the hallway was clear and although there was the sound of scraping footsteps at a distance they came no nearer i would have time to discover a way from the inn without passing that room below where hogarth sprawled a strange alluring perfume breathed from the woman in my arms i became more keenly conscious of her proximity for she was a woman such as aroused in a man the wonder for her kind soft to the touch she lay pressed to me her head resting on my shoulder her right arm so tightly clinging to my coat collar that it brushed my neck with each movement of mine she was breathing heavily she had offered no objection to my bold lifting of her i knew by this that she had surrendered any hope she may have had of getting out of this tangle alone i felt that she was reposing all her abused faith in me and my heart beat savagely to meet that faith and bring her into permanent safety turning my head i looked into her eyes so near so deep with golden wonder so open with wide fear and horror a gentle shivering possessed her from head to foot how long would it be before those frayed nerves were soothed to their natural calm she looked back into my eyes tried to smile her confidence and only moaned i ground my teeth in rage when i tightened my grasp of her i felt her heart pound close to mine veritably my roughness fell away in the contact with a holy feminine woman then the realization came over me that i was more than passingly interested in this creature of misfortune ay truly i was falling in love 
the thought overcame the practical need of the moment and made me thrill as i had never thrilled before it was unalloyed sweetness but i was recalled to the present do you know this inn madam i asked in a low voice which way to the back of the house hark where do those steps go ah oh, they've turned off to the left senor her voice vibrated tremblingly in my ear the mad caprice to kiss those warm lips forced me to say no more but stride rapidly to the left her pointing hand guided me we approached a closed door which when i lowered her she was able to open and in we pushed the interior was small and narrow and exceedingly dark i thrust out a careful foot at each step and met the dropping off however the steps down were few and were followed by a circuitous passage in the dusk i felt her right hand draw closer as did her head in a sort of childish fear of the shadows instinctively my two arms pressed her to my chest and in the next moment i was ashamed of such emotion but the doing of it was lost on her oh senor what is that sound ahead of us who is coming i stopped short and listened it was true that someone was in this same passage and making for the place where we stood we must not be discovered here i tried to think of escape my elbow touched the wall on the left my knee prodded the wainscoting on the right the feet that came on were shuffling neither of us spoke she was trusting to me i began to retrace my way keeping my elbow brushing the wall to find a diverging passage or at least an angle in which we could lose ourselves at the foot of the steps the wall broke off i turned there and immediately came face to face with a door at my whispered word she tried the knob it refused to yield she caught a sob in her throat and stifled it aided by the wall i supported her in one arm and myself attempted to force an exit that this could not be done i realized with a single effort rust perhaps had secured it as firmly as iron bolts barely in time i faced about and held the woman as close as possible but it was not close enough end of section seven section eight of the thrill book volume one number six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by libvox fifty three the thrill book volume one number six the devil's own by chester l saxby chapter seven the shuffling steps were upon us in the gloaming the figure loomed to the height of a tall man and before he was abreast of us the further sound as of hard hands rubbing over coarse plaster told me that he felt his way on either side then a click of indrawn breath and he had paused in front of us his left hand still moved on and bent around the angle of the wall directly to us it touched my hair it did not pause but crept down and across my face and still i held my breath and no one spoke to my shoulder thence to my arm stole the hand a great horny hand that was ready doubtless to double into a flying weapon of offence it had almost reached to my waist and there it encountered the skirts and limbs of the trembling woman she groaned her pent despair and in the echo came his hoarse oath with it the loosing of a whiskey-soaked breath malin he blared and again malin answer is it you malin i did not answer and his hand leaped back i set myself for the blow that would crash out of the blackness but instead the darkness itself dropped away in the flaring of a match the light revealed hogarth's glassy eyes and puffed face it's my own little lorraine he grunted but his teeth were bared i thought you were locked up 
but the key is gone from my pocket. Thought you might come this way. Eh, hey, it's Mr. Malin, too. I guess. Well, eh, Malin? Where do you two go? Are you lost, as I am? What a dark hole. Is the lady dead? No, I gave him back. She's not dead. And I mean her to live, Hevel Hogarth. I took the key. Stand out of the way. We go the way you came. Good. I can go that way as well. I'm lost, you see. His manner baffled me. I thought him still stupid from the effects of the whiskey. Why else should he stand staring at us and keep that smile about his lips? He did lurch and sway dizzily. Besides, a man can't fight off so soon a potion such as he had drunk. Lead on and I'll follow. He waved and fell back. At the end of the stairs turn to the right. It's at the left I came into this infernal blackness. You want the other way. I ventured no opposition and set off. Was he so drunk after all? He kept behind us, silent now. My teeth were clenched with the instinctive awaiting of a knife blade betwixt my shoulders, for he would never forgive this attempt at escape. But we compassed the passage without incident. The woman was clinging to me no longer. She had fainted when Hogarth voiced his first oath. A flight of steps interrupted our going. We went down them and turned to the right. After a little, a door halted us. Hogarth thrust me aside and put his shoulder to it. It broke open. Warm sunlight blinded me. Here was outside air and judging from the smell, an alley. Straight ahead in a moment, I made out masts and tops moving easily in a gentle surf. No, said Hogarth with firmness untouched by drink. We won't go till it's dark. We'd draw a crowd. A long wait, Mr. Malin, but you're rather to blame for that yourself. Set her down in the corner. She won't wake up. Be easy, mate. She doesn't go to the brig, I told him while he softly closed the door, plunging us into immediate darkness. I don't fancy that marooning plan. That's all right, Mr. Malin. You'll come to it. Be easy. You're a good man to have, eh? A good man, Mr. Malin. Get some sleep if you can. I saw the uselessness of disagreement. There would be ample time for consideration in the hours before darkness intervened. I laid the woman on the bare floor, but supported her head on my knee. I could not see her face, but her hair was soft and thick, and the touch of it sent my heart thrumming. Hogarth sat down beside me and prepared to wait out the intolerable time. I stared into the dark and thought. Hogarth had no immediate intent of doing away with her. His very inactivity proclaimed that. It further proclaimed that I was right in believing him powerless to commit a violence against her. Then she was temporarily safe, but he had kept the purpose to take her aboard the brig. Well, if she were taken there, where lay the harm? And might there not be good instead of harm? A port more adapted to losing oneself, eh? Or a ship spoken on the sea? In Cadiz one could find no help or even understanding. It were useless or worse to ask. Why not seem to fall in with Hogarth and his marooning until the moment came for certain escape? He would awaken to my hostility and to the object of my being in the passage, if he did not already comprehend it, which I felt that he did. But I had become important to him, despite my obvious friendship for the woman. He appeared to suffer no change as to my future worth. God, what a fool I was to reason thus! And so the time dragged by, hour after hour, with only a shifting of position in one or the other of us, until the woman groaned and sat up, uttering a queer little cry at the blackness. I felt a desire to hold her close and soothe her. We are yet in the passage of the inn, madam, I said. When the night comes, we will go. Hevel Hogarth is here and wishes you no harm. Quiet yourself. I groped about to find her hand and pressed it in the dark. I think she gained some sort of courage from that and remained still, but she was trembling. 
Hey, Hevel Hogarth is here, answered that harsh voice. There need be no fear as long as they don't find Gifford's body in that room yonder. She shook as with ague at these words, then followed absolute silence. At length, when an infinite time had elapsed, the gloom deepened to shadowless nothingness. From the crack of the door the single smutted ray faded little by little. I put out my hand and staring at it saw nothing. Night had fallen. Hogarth moved first and cautiously consulted the alley. He came back and spoke in a whisper. I drew up my legs, stiff with sitting, and leaned down for the woman. But she held herself off and questioned me fearfully. We are not going with him. You will not betray me, Signor. Never, I swore for her ear alone. Then, so that he might hear, Can you walk, or must I carry you still? We have a fair way to go. She struggled up and reached the door where, but for my quick catching of her, she must have fallen. I picked her up as before and bore her along, Hogarth making no offer of assistance, as well I knew he would not. The alley was full darkened. The night was cloudy. At the end of the day, the shipping lay outlined against a hazy horizon. But the skiff in which we had come ashore was tied further down the harbor. We found it unhailed and cast off. Some sacking Hogarth snatched from a warehouse door and flung into the bottom. During the journey, the woman had spoken not a word, but hid her face in my greasy coat to choke back, perhaps, the torrent of fears that beset her. Her helplessness brought a twinge to my emotions that was as profound as it was uncommon. Once I managed on the way to drop behind a dozen steps and so whisper close to her ear that her ignorance of the goal might be in part known and her dread thereby abated. Shh! I prefaced my hushed words. We go aboard Hogarth's ship, for he will have you by. But I swear to a rescue, and not one hair of you shall be hurt. The speech was new to me and strange, but she showed that it had been happily made by pressing my arm, a, and I loved her for it and was satisfied. At the wharf lay the skiff, seeing it, she turned upon Hogarth fairly. Hevel Hogarth, she said, there is no choice but that I go with you. Yet I have never worked you wrong, and I deserve no such treatment. What you may do, no man might know. But to bring me hurt will blacken your soul, Hevel Hogarth, your soul. Hogarth spun around and flung his hands to his hips to keep them, I thought, from resting elsewhere. His eyes gleamed wickedly. The whiskey was no more in power. My soul, is it? What is that? And what may you know of a soul? Be sure Hevel Hogarth will rejoice in hell for ridding the world of a blacker than his. His lips shut tight, and he swore in his throat. A. He had said too much for his purpose. We got into the skiff, Hogarth motioning me to the stern sheets with a woman, himself taking the oars. The surf was but a harmless roll, and soon we were beyond it. Past hulk after hulk we were thrust by his prodigious pulling when of a sudden he ceased to row and leaned toward us. Mr. Malan, bundle her into the sacking and be quick. You, Lorraine, keep your mouth shut and make no sounds. For the first outcry there is ready a speedy knife, do you hear? Mr. Malan, when you swarm aboard, swing her over your shoulder like a sack of clothing. There's to be no knowing of this, he spoke strongly, and after the manner I knew in him. I felt that I was under severe watchfulness, that the woman's fate was mine as well. We obeyed silently. I took the sacking he flung and entirely enveloped her from head to foot. She lay in the skiff's bottom, a lifeless cargo. Hogarth pushed on and hailed the brig's deck. Some heads were craned over the side, then down came a rope ladder. Hogarth went up first, and I heard his voice cutting off the various expostulations at his long absence. I hoisted the sacked woman to my shoulder, managing to whisper a word of encouragement, then up I swarmed, one-handed. As I came over the rail, willing hands went out to relieve me of my burden, 
but hogarth's stentorian tones burned their way with a swift effect hold off there let him be damn you take your hands to your pockets then to me throw the stuff into the cabin mr malan and i'll sort it later a dozen eyes scanned the burden with more than common curiosity and hogarth stood back with a beady tenseness of gaze for every man of them i swung easily through them and down into the captain's cabin where i loosened the coarse fibre from the exhausted woman and left her to dispose herself in an uninterrupted rest on the deck hogarth was receiving a report of the unloading it appeared that the entire cargo had been taken off and accounts rendered but that the oil and wool for which hogarth contracted had not come aboard hogarth was in a terrific mood volatile and unapproachable the men kept clear of him but his choleric swearings rang from stem to stern and when i presented myself he hauled me aside the brig is light he said but we'll chance no more days here south again and that to-night we go in ballast pipe all hands and make ship and mind sir it must be done in silence just the jib and royal that'll drop us down to the point his voice sank to a whisper where is she in the cabin resting i said shortly where will you stow her your business is on deck he curtly responded and turned on his heel i held my anger and set about to up anchor the men went at it with a will and in no time two bits of canvas were drawing what wind there was we stole out past darkened vessels to the glimmering point an hour later cadiz was far behind the mainsail was fluttering out and the fair sea gambled past our bows as we frisked through to the west then it was that i looked about for hogarth there was no sign of him above decks i chafed with various conjectures of his absence what could occupy him below might i have mistaken his proneness to keep his hands from the woman and were my words of trust availing her nothing at this very moment i fixed the ship's course and then stealthily made down the steps to the captain's cabin one glance sufficed to tell me that the woman was gone at the farther wall a thin makeshift of single lathes beyond which was a carpenter's workroom with his head bent to the glittering knife in his hand stood hogarth knit of brow my fear for the woman bounded up past my control, and I cried out to him, What have you done? Good God, where is she? I pointed to the knife. A slight start at my voice, that was all, and he stared so evenly at me that I think he was gauging me finally. He held the knife carelessly. It gleamed cleanly and showed no trace of blood. In another moment he scowled and spoke. You talk too loud, Mr. Malan she is where i would have her what do you want here you're on duty above be lively sir the wind is freshening but i did not move the man there the woman gone the air of mystery the knife tapping his palm suddenly the rebellion thus far held down blazed too hot for concealing and i lost my head hevel hogarth mr hogarth he corrected me in no uncertainty Hevel Hogarth, I said again, and there was fire betwixt us. I'll not be put off this time. This is a rotten game you play, and by God it's going to stop. That woman is clean of any plot against you. Old Joe lied to you. She never opened her mouth to hurt you. You're on the wrong track, and you've murdered an innocent man. Mr. Malan, too gently rose Hogarth's voice. You're talking to your superior. I don't like your tone, Mr. Malan. His eyes smoldered. You can like it or not, I rushed on. I'm talking to a murderer and a forger. To hell with your six dollars a day. What have you done with the woman? And still he only tapped his palm with a knife, a long and very thin weapon tapering to a needle point. His calmness exasperated me unreasonably. Are you a better man than I am? He put, narrowing his eyes your talk is so is your arm so could you knock me down now do you think no i have a different test his gaze roved to the knife thence to the wall behind him 
Only the low-bred resort to their fists, Malin. Dexterity, that's it, eh? Very good. Dexterity, let it be. Can you throw a knife? I wonder. Every expert seaman knows the handling of a knife. With a stub of a pencil he approached the wall, measured it deliberately, and with extraordinary care from either end of the room, at length described on the plaster a small circle. This he scanned for a moment, then stood off and handed me the knife. Mr. Malin, you have some nasty things to say. If you're the better man, I'll not stop your saying them. Yonder is the target. To the hilt, or it's no fit shot, and a poor drive for a strong man. I'm fair to every man, but there's law and limit. Beat me, and the woman's yours. End of section 8section nine of the thrill book volume one number six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by libvox fifty three the thrill book volume one number six the devil's own by chester l saxby Chapter 8. I gripped the knife for pure light-heartedness, surveyed the rude circle on the wall, loosed a quick look at Hogarth, and found no reason for the docile expression in his face, nor yet for his offer of immunity. It was not like him, and still, had not much the same thing happened on the day I had signed with him? I clenched the poniard. If I were the better man, I laughed suddenly. For this was a game to my liking and ability but i was unconvinced you grant me the woman if i win the stroke you'll release her swear i required thoughtless of the picture of hogarth's word linked with honor ay he said and swore you may have her dead or alive as you will this roused no suspicions and meant nothing more to me than i had asked i therefore stood for the throw and as I did so, it seemed that the thin wall swayed ever so little before my sight, and that the plaster gave forth a heavy and repeated crackle, as if a body flung against it. I lowered my arm and strode forward to investigate the cause, when Hogarth shoved me back and motioned me to fire ahead. The wind straining at the beams, hurry, he ordered, do you fear the bet? Fear the devil, I hurled, and backed to where I had been. With eyes and hand I took methodical aim and let fly. The knife circled twice through the air, met the plaster with a sharp hiss, and bedded deep, so that only the black hilt protruded. I saw the success of the throw, almost a perfect bull's-eye. I faced Hogarth with something akin to a swagger, and found him pale, with eyes riveted on the wall, but his mouth was drawn into a smile for all his eyes, unwillingness, and he grinned back. The shrewdest blow that ever went from mortal hand, Mr. Malin. God, look at the thing sticking there, full to the hilt, and you're the better man. These hands couldn't have done that. The last sentence struck me oddly, so like another speech of his was it. I crossed to the wall and laid hold of the knife. It came forth with a single wrench and lay in my hand. A cruel weapon, I grunted, scanning it. The longest blade, the thinnest point. I could go no further, or rather I found my mind springing away from the crudely erected concealment to grapple with a terrorizing thought. How it came to me I cannot explain that it came with a rush that fairly staggered me suffices. I let go my breath in a cry of madness and fixed my gaze on Hogarth. Have I? Is she there? You wolf, have you played dirt with me? At the same instant we started for the padlocked door. I was by him while he fumbled with the lock. You guess well, he mumbled as he worked over it. It's the woman you want. I've had no throw, but it's no account. You win, and so do I. All I care for is done. Eh, Malin, the job's done. 
Six dollars a day it is, and cheap, dirt cheap. Stand aside. The lock was sprung, and he tore it off. In with you. Call out what you see, and be sure the job's not half done. I scrambled through the opening. Inside I came erect and slowly adjusted my sight to the semi-darkness. The room was dismantled and littered with carpentry effects. Jury stays and shrouds and what not. But all this was by the way. Lashed on a huge chest, with her head and shoulders pinioned to a scantling of the wall, was the woman, Lorraine, ghastly white and staring. All her face was set in untold agony, all but her mouth that held a gag of rope. Gasping out senseless gibberish, I rushed upon her and did a dozen childish inanities, prying at the brutal rope, groping for her pulse, shouting out to her, attempting to shake her into sensibility. She changed neither color nor expression, and I chatteringly told myself that she was dead, killed by the knife which I had flung, killed by the very person who had vowed to seal her from harm. I came to swift and awful silence, faced by a terrible truth. Lorraine, who had prayed me, a stranger, for help, who had placed her overbalancing fears and hopes in my hands and reposed to the future in my keeping, who had lain in my arms with the perfume of her presence, restoring something of the manhood that I had, of late forsworn. Lorraine had been murdered and by unsuspecting hands. In that awful silence I stood, and the waves of frigid despair followed the waves of scalding passion over and through my body and mind. I was alone with a rising madness, and then, out of that awful silence, drove a wonderfully exhilarating sight. From the tendency to becoming a maniac, it thrust me back into the zone of rationality. On the edge of total blackness I paused, and the voice of reason spoke and cleared the deeps. The thing that I observed was but a pinhole in the plaster, an inch from the woman's head and to the left. The stronger light of the cabin behind it made it radiate dully, but I saw it, and it was the most joyous sight that ever my eyes rested on. In a trice I recognized it for the opening made by the dagger. The blow had been an inch to the side, the murder had been averted by the chances which favored the error. Lorraine was safe, had only fainted from the horrible exposure of ears and nerves. I thudded to my knees. I was so filled with intense happiness that I reacted to a childhood's habit of prayer. I thanked aloud the God who watched over destiny. I called upon him to hear that I would defend this woman with every effort of my body and mind, and until death released me. And as fate would have it, my prayer was broken into by a singular sound that brought me up off my knees and turned my heart to metal. It was the voice of Hogarth, laughing. One moment the knife was on the floor where I had dropped it. The next it was in my closed hand, and I was bursting through the low opening. I saw the greater light, and in the midst of it Hogarth, with his lips still parted in a waiting grin. Then the grin fell away. He had seen my face and the knife gripped in my hand. He crouched low, and neither advanced nor retreated. Only intense surprise welled up in his eyes, and back of the surprise were kindled live coals in the blackness. Hogarth, Hogarth, you devil, you damned hound! I rasped bitterly, all the rioting lights of anger blotting out caution and reason. I sprang, and the face of him blurred into cloud and fog, in which I locked myself, and fought as I had never fought before, a and never will fight more. All the memory of it sickens me as I lie now and wait, wait for that terror of eternity. I had been made to do what the stomach of this animal held him from doing, and only a tremendously thankful mistake had restrained me from murder. The woman bound there, hearing all, knowing when God of mercy, would she ever forgive me? Would she ever comprehend the truth of it? Would she look once more into my eyes and smile and trust me? All this I prayed for in that first second of launching against the object of devouring revenge. For I loved her, I knew it now. 
she had won every nobler impulse of my being and i would prove it with the last strength that lay within me hogarth's gorilla arms were about me the knife dropped to the floor nor had i intended using it i would kill him with my naked hands as he deserved or i would die as giffreth bartold had done with that unbreakable mocking grip at my throat denying breath denying a last frenzied plea to my creator but i was girded by the strength of the mad the power of curdled fury was mine i wrenched i tore at him i was bereft of cunning only to be endowed with unnatural energy he was the better man as muscle goes but in that moment i knew myself his temporary equal and he fought with the strength of the despicable serpent he fought and fighting laughed he called on me to save my skin and cool my head i heard him and consigned him to everlasting damnation he was a snake in cunning and command but i i was a tiger back and forth we threshed from wall to wall from pitching table to swaying bunk and back again from my grip he strove loose ripping clean off his shoulders the coat that i clutched we closed the second time he picking his hold i blind to everything but the slaving torment that scorched me on he had me those were his terrible hands that clamped my neck i roared out my rage and twisted my neck until the bones cracked but the hands came away instantly they were elsewhere everywhere high low incredibly swift and vulturous in my blindness i saw them hunting eluding plying where the defense was thinnest and yet i saw them not at all my own hands worked without plan with only purpose my mind worked dully and goaded me with the picture of a woman's blighted face time swept by it was measured in the pulse beats of too heavily striving blood it was measured in the coming and going of heated breath it was measured in the sloughing grind of strained heels and ever i counted it second by second until the last beat should blot out sense and feeling then my hands plied no further the cords of his sweating neck swelled beneath my fingers his throat with its discordant music of dry whistling compressed to billow forth to sink in hollows there to remain if i could lock my thumbs where they were if i could stand the inhumane pain of his hand on my chin lifting it bending it till death seemed a cheap price to pay for a moment of respite a surcease from a drenching misery if body and soul might still cleave together while i counted a better man a better man i prayed for strength to kill with the drum of unconsciousness beginning to beat in my ears i prayed and my prayer was heard his knees gave way we were down his breath was sucked into a sound as of the surf over coarse sand so near the bunk we were that i narrowly missed breaking my temples against the wood his hands relaxed in the fall and i could have cried my exultation for my own gave no wit but my triumph was short-lived and foolhardy to my ears my clearing mind brought the sound of rough hands moving over the floor moving slowly slowly and for what need i guess could i doubt those hands were hevel hogarth's hands and they groped stealthily for the means of furtive murder they sought the knife i had let fall a moment more and the sound ceased i gasped with intolerable dread i could not release my hold i must not something rattled and likewise was still an age drifted by with that uncanny throat that i clutched still stiff and holding its own the end came with a violent convulsion i felt a startling pain in my side i was conscious that he had found the knife and had struck a nausea settled over me and turning to weakness defied my pressing thumbs i was losing all strength the next stab might be my heart in this exigency my fingers tore loose of their lawful prize and fell in scant time upon his stretched arm 
The knife was lifted, I caught it, swung to ward it off, and down it leaped with all my weight behind it, fairly to his own ribs. I rolled away. The blood was spurting from his open shirt, and very quickly dyed his chest. His right hand still gripped the handle of the knife. The rest of it was buried in his flesh. His eyes were upon me, baffled eyes that were yet grim. His teeth were set in pain, but fell apart almost at once. I got up, reeling, and clung to the edge of the bunk. I was fascinated by what I had done. Hogarth, Hogarth, I cried out. You're done for. I've killed you. His lips were black, but not so black as Bartold's lips had been. They worked in a sad effort for breath. There was breath aplenty for him now, but he was past using it. He was staring at me, a great astonishment in his eyes. Better man, those dark lips mumbled. Better man, that's right. Damn you, did it. His right hand came away from his body. With it came the knife. The blood sped out afresh. He was well nigh gone, but the daredevil in him would live out his last clinging second. He half raised himself and tried to laugh. I think he even tried to speak. Then, like a lump of clay that he was, he thudded back and only the grin remained. I had forgotten the woman, insane for revenge, the subject of my wild act had been momentarily erased from my thought. Now that the act was accomplished, she flashed back into my consciousness with increased vividness. To the carpenter's room I rushed, dizzy and addle-headed as I was, and brought her forth, past the lifeless form of her evil Jenny, to the healing freshness of the night breeze. On deck I encountered no one. The helmsman was at his post, and the lookout showed a motionless back. Alone with this woman, who had been spared to me as by the will of a God I had for years forgotten. I worked to bring her back to realization of her surroundings, to the knowledge of security and peace, when at length she opened her eyes with a fluttering sigh. I told her, told her all that had occurred, told her the worst and the best, and because I couldn't stop there, because there was a thankfulness and a humbleness in my heart that demanded expression, I told her more. I told her that my hands would never cease to shield her and protect the peace that they had been allowed to offer her, that later, when certain things had resolved into less vivid memory, I would, I must say more. Then in the blackness of the night we sailed briskly and with new hopes on the wings of morning. There lies the thing as it was done. One soul forgave me, one heart that knew no guilt looked out of two golden eyes and called it right. But that soul and that heart are not sufficient to purge the stain, and the world must judge with her. I have spoken the truth and spared nothing. May that truth spare me in the great accounting which is near. The End End of Section 9《Section Ten of the Thrill Book, Volume One, Number Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Eli Quill. The Thrill Book, Volume One, Number Six. After, by Harold Hersey as Charles Kiproy. I have been singing in a desert, yet the sky was wide around me. Blind I was unto the sun, yet her golden tresses bound me. I have been singing of life's madness, like a child who feebly chatters, voicing all the spirit's sadness, as though that even matters. While I sang each doleful dirge on my rusty lyre's strings, I forgot the maddening urge that lifts one up and sings. There upon the mighty desert I had faltered in my flight, I who wandered on my journey through darkness and through light. End of section 10 
Section 11 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Bowden. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Odds and Ends by Charles Kiproy. Corpse is tied in the river. Unusually uncanny suicide, or a most peculiar murder, is believed to be behind the death of an unidentified man whose body was found recently bound with rope and moored to the shore of the Delaware at the foot of Perticarius Avenue, near the suspension bridge over the overflow of Sanecan Creek. The gruesome find was made by Kid Henry, Boxer, and David Russell and George Blaze, both of 159 Pennington Avenue, Trenton, New Jersey. The arms of the corpse were tied with a piece of rope, and another rope 150 feet long was tied to the waist, the shore end being fastened to a tree. Henry and his two companions were walking along the banks of the river when they saw the rope. They began to haul it in and were horrified to see a human body tied on the end of it. Henry immediately notified Sergeant Hebner at police headquarters, who sent the police ambulance, reserve officer McDonald, and chauffeur Breast, and patrol men fay to the scene the dead man was clad in working men's clothing he was about 50 years old and had not been in the water more than one day there was nothing in the pockets or on the body to make identification possible there were no marks of violence to be found it may be that the man tied himself up and jumped into the river after fastening the end of the line to the tree to ensure the recovery of his body he couldn't banish the ghastly sight. H.B. Kelly, former secretary of the Chamber of Commerce, now a YMCA secretary in northern Italy, tells of seeing a wounded soldier who could not banish from his mind the sight of a dying German woman soldier who was bayoneted to death as she was strapped to a machine gun. I had a strange experience while helping unload some of the wounded American soldiers, Kelly writes to his wife, one of them badly hurt, was unable to get out of his mind one incident of the hand-to-hand -hand fight in which he was engaged. Charging a machine gun nest, he ran his bayonet through a soldier. As the latter dropped to the ground, the helmet fell off and the American realized he had killed a woman who was chained to a machine gun. The soldier raved continually about the incident while delirious. He said he could never forget the sight of the woman's long yellow hair, which fell about her shoulders as she dropped to the ground. We have read of the hellish practice of chaining women to guns, but now I know it was true. Hat blows off and on again. While John Hoey was passing the Jerky department store in Bucksville, Pennsylvania, on his way to the post office, the wind lifted his hat from his head and carried it high into the air. Hoey ran after it, hoping to recover it when it landed. Strange to relate, but vouched for by several witnesses, his headpiece came down and landed right side up on his head after Hoey had run a distance of several rods. End of section 11. Section 12 of The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by LibVox53. The Thrill Book, Volume 1, Number 6. Magic in Manhattan by Robert W. Snedden. Part 1. Oh, come in, come in, I cried out impatiently. Someone shuffled his feet, coughed, and then pushed open the door. I turned in my chair and scowled at the intruder, a long, lanky body clad in a shoddy suit, which had at some remote period dangled outside a second-hand clothes store and was now held together by pins, was topped by a pale face. The tip of the long nose twitched nervously. The eyes were large and brown, and for a moment I could have sworn that a dog's soul, loving and appealing, looked out of them. But I dismissed the fancy. 
His shoes were a mere latticework of leather through which peeped red socks. If it is books, I said sharply, stifling my better feelings, I don't want them. As you see, I have all I want. If it is anything else, there's the door. The face of the unknown crinkled in a whimsical smile, and again I was reminded of a dog and hesitated. No, sir, it is not books, he said plaintively. Then what is it? I'm busy. It is dogs. Well, not dogs exactly. Some dog, to be precise, he answered, bringing into view a small box of inlaid wood about three inches square. Some dog? Here? You seem tired. Sit down. Now what is it? But don't be long. He laid his shabby hat on the floor and sat down. When I said some dog, he began, no doubt I surprised you. By the by, I interrupted, Harvard or Yale? Harvard, he replied dully, but we won't discuss that if you don't mind. This little box holds the result of eight years' study and research. Began when I first went into rooms. You know what that means. You get in, turn on the light, and there you are with your books, the loneliest creature on earth. Don't make friends easily, but I can get next to a child or a dog in five minutes. I wanted a dog, but you know what cruelty it is to leave the poor thing all day. Believe me, a dog gets the blues just like any of us. Ever leave your dog for a day? When you come back, it falls all over you for joy. Yes, it's fine to have a dog, but it's no fun for the dog. Well, mine was the scientific side. I never did much good at it. My brain was always buzzing with other problems. My best friend was a Hindu who knew more than his professors. Once in fun, I told him of an idea of mine. He looked at me appealingly. Go on. I can spare you a few minutes. Maybe crazy, my idea. But I thought of a dog that could accommodate itself to all places and circumstances. If I were out, the dog would be latent, and on my return, all I had to do was to will he should be there. Sounds rubbish, I dare say. He seemed so anxious to please that I hadn't the heart to tell him to clear out, and I nodded wisely. Also, he continued with a faint smile, there's times when you may want a big dog or a little. If you're going by train, how convenient if your boarhound could turn into a toy dog. Time after time we tried experiments. No, not vivisection. I like dogs too much for that. But psychic suggestion. I know dogs. I lived five years with them, constantly till I could read every thought that passed through their brains. And they have brains. We got pretty deep in occult learning, my friend and me. And we hit it, sir. We hit it at last. We found out how to change the outer envelope of a living substance and leave the soul. We'll call it the soul, unchanged. We came on it suddenly, and before we realized it, the secret was ours. My friend died shortly afterward, and just before he died he confided to me that in all probability his next incarnation would be in the form of a dog. Now the dog which I have here was evolved at the moment of his death and though I haven't been able to trace any connection between Ram Nugar, Ah, oh, that was his name, I murmured. Yes, and of the dog, I have a strong conviction that they are connected in some way. Hmm, very, very interesting, I commented, rubbing my ankles together to assure myself that I was in room 2005 of the Flatitron building and not in bed. Only I see no dog. Pardon me. He is in this box, he said, kneeling on the floor and laying the small box carefully on it. You have no objection to an auricular demonstration? None, provided there is no smoke or smell. He took no notice but opened the box. Please look into the box. Good. You see something in it, and it reminds you of what? I rather resented this cross-examination, but after all, looks like a piece of dried leather. Good. Now watch. Oh, by the by, what sort of dog are you partial to? I rather fancy bulldogs, I answered after some cogitation. 
there was a period of strained silence during which the stranger gazed fixedly at the box placed his hands in certain positions and finally said in a loud voice no i won't relate what he did say because i promised never to reveal it and in spite of what happened eventually i am a man of my word to my horrified astonishment i fancied i heard the faint tickle of a bell and a large bulldog appeared from nowhere standing on the floor at once licking its master's hand affectionately i started back in my chair have no fear he's absolutely harmless aren't you ram the mention of the, his name seemed to affect the dog and he careered wildly about the room finally bringing up against my legs i leaned down and stroked him and he wagged his tail he is all there i murmured feebly the stranger let a comprehensive smile somewhat wistful and sad creep over his face all there but the bark not dumb surely i queried yes at will bark ram ram gave vent to a succession of barks and growls that will do i said hastily there are other people in the building i trust that my demonstration is satisfactory oh quite quite i hastened to assure him of course he said with an eager look in his eyes you might prefer a great dane or a saint bernard too big i said shortly i could never think of keeping a dog like that in town ah i think you fail to see my point you can have any size of dog you like come here ram down commanded his master gazing at him fixedly he performed the same tricks as before over his body ending by repeating the words simultaneously the bulldog vanished and a huge dane came into view so suddenly that the stranger was propelled upon his back i could have sworn i heard a bell ring at my ear but as coming from a great distance it was queer but the stranger said nothing and i thought i must have imagined it quiet ram he ordered picking himself up the dog stood like a statue you see the beauty of it is this at the word of command you can control him so effectually that he would stand for a year you could go away to the north pole and come back to find him in the same position but but i stammered does he ever eat never why should he he is merely a product of your own will invested with a body now sir to come to the point i haven't had a square meal for days and i want to sell ram to you why to me eh why to me man because you are the only person who hasn't turned me away as a charlatan as a crazy liar and his voice faltered i may have wiped away a tear myself who knows i am only a humble writer and the price i asked twenty plucks dollars i mean twenty i echoed and looked at the dog why not i had always wanted a dog my wife adored them i mechanically felt in my pocket for my bill case good you buy then wait a bit though i'd better teach you how to change him surely you must swear never to divulge the secret to anyone it is attended with considerable risk those who are concerned have means and ways of finding out and i'm taking a big chance myself trust me i assured him you needn't worry about me i more than regret i cannot set down what ensued i almost repented of my bargain but finally after several attempts my efforts in producing and transforming ram were successful i handed over the bill shook my instructor by the hand and led him to the door oh i forgot he said softly as he went out be sure you don't transform him more than three times a day why what would happen i started but he was gone i put the box in my pocket and set out home i would not have felt so happy had i known to what a medley of fantastic happenings i had pledged myself it never occurred to me till i was closing the door of my dwelling that my wife might not regard our new pet in quite the same light as i did i am the last person in the world to practice duplicity but as i stood there on the rug i realized with a sense of discomfort 
that i could not divulge anything about the arabian afternoon's entertainment in which i had taken part trusting as she is she would never believe me i hated to do it but it was plain i had to make up some story about it and i needed time for that i hung up my coat on the rack and with a stealthy glance around started to tiptoe to my library door then the overcoat perversely flung itself off the hook and flopped to the floor my worst anticipations were realized my wife had appeared through the curtains at the parlor door oh is that you dear i thought you might be sleeping and so i mumbled but dear you know i never sleep in the afternoon she proclaimed in evident surprise well it's hardly afternoon now i said making a swift step to the rack and lifting up my coat as i did so i contrived to cover up the box two facts just passed the winning post in my brain circus then one was that i had forgotten to ask the name and address of the stranger and i wished i had never set eyes upon him and second that i was a singularly unskillful liar oh mary i said as calmly and convincingly as i could i have a little job for you to fix the tag on this coat surely i'll do it now bring it in i wasn't prepared for this oh tomorrow will do tomorrow no hurry or i have to do some writing later on and so you can do it then for a moment my fate hung in the balance and then mary drew in her head and i dashed into the library where to hide the confounded thing where i felt like a thief no reason for it the box was mine by right of purchase though there was a suspicion of magic attached to it well the magic was no more than the workings of some new law in nature i have no doubt the inventor of that mysterious instrument of torture the piano player handled his creation with the same secrecy as i did my box at last in desperation i hid it in the waste paper basket no one would touch that till morning i went through to the parlor extremely cheerful i even whistled what i whistled has no bearing on the story it was probably one of my bathroom improvisations we sat down to dinner and everything passed off safely till the coffee which came in with a bomb oh dear me said my wife such an amusing little booklet came today toothpaste dentrifice just the cutest thing i meant to keep it for you i wonder where i laid it why i believe i must have put it in your waste paper basket i'll run and get it you will laugh i know i did there was such a dear little boy cold beads of perspiration stood out on my forehead in the approved novelistic fashion a plague on all novelists why do they invent such things oh toothbees i faltered and then plunged i got one at the office very amusing very mary looked her disappointment and i was going to keep it for you you can always make a verse out of anything like that for one of the weeklies or an editorial or something the last page was awfully good it was i said gulping down my coffee and rising hastily the people who write those things are extremely er intelligent but the expenditure of hot air is hardly commensurate with the degree of elevation of the masses thereby further than that i can say no more and now i must get to work pertinax said my wife anxiously you must have caught cold to-day your voice sounds so so hoarse tut tut nothing wrong with me you're not going to write any jokes tonight i hope dear the last time you were quite depressed the next day you remember not tonight something more serious i replied reassuringly it was i was possessed by a demon of curiosity i retired to the library closed the door and drawing the box from among the torn paper gazed at it i had a foolish fear that something might go wrong i might even be so perturbed as to conjure up a tiger or an elephant both unpleasant house pets still i was prepared for anything that is the advantage of the literary life i listened all was still next door and i went through my formula tremulously 
I was delighted to see Ram appear, and the affectionate creature manifested his joy by burbling through his flattened nose and beating his tail on my legs. Good dog, good old fellow, I murmured to him. He stared up into my face with intelligent eyes, speaking eyes, I might almost say. The more I looked at him, the more I fancied him. Unique, I repeated to myself again. No worry, no care. The only fly in the ointment was that I had to keep him hid. I would be unable to flaunt him in the face of Tilby, who boasts of the ownership of a bad-tempered terrier, descended from the dog kings of Aaron. Ram was sitting quietly by, so, drawing over a pad, I began to jot down an idea that had come to me. All at once I became conscious that something was wrong. Ram, where in heaven's name was the dog? The door was shut. Had he dissolved into his native air? The box, it was empty. I groveled on my knees. I peered under the couch, the table, the chairs. Not a trace of him. My twenty dollars had vanished, and my anticipation of occult delvings blasted. Suddenly I thought to myself, what if he has gone next door? But how? Anyway, I got up and pushed open the door of the parlor cautiously. At once a lumbering creature bound up from the floor by my wife's side and gambled about me an effusive welcome. "'Why, Pert,' cried my wife, "'he seems to know you. "'Know me, my dear. "'Where did he come from?' "'I don't know. "'He must have crept in and hid himself. "'He was so friendly when I looked up "'and saw him that I let him stay. "'So this is why you looked so guilty tonight.' "'Guilty?' I ejaculated feebly. I knew there was something wrong. You couldn't have given me a lovelier birthday present, dearest. Glad you like him. He's an, uh, exceptionally well-trained dog. I'm sure he must be hungry, poor fellow. I may have been mistaken, but there seemed to be a, a gleam of anticipation in Ram's eyes. Oh, I'll see to that. Do let me feed him, Pert. We have some lovely bones. Mary, I said severely. This is a valuable dog, which I intend to look after very closely. I shall die at it myself. Very well, dear, but I hate to see any animal go hungry. No feeding at odd times, or he'll get disagreeable and die of an enlarged liver. Now I must finish my work. Come along, Ram. Ram followed me unwillingly. Now, sir, I said, once more behind the library door, no more fool tricks. I don't like em. See, Ram's attitude became positively propitiatory, and he lay down and beamed up into my face. I was puzzled what to do with him, leave him as he was, or put him back in the box. If I did that, there would be questions in the morning. Finally, I recollected his seller's advice, and pointing to a corner, I said sharply, Over there, old boy, now quiet, Ram. The effect of these words was marvelous. His limbs grew rigid, and but for a gentle snore he might have been a stuffed dog. The sight was uncanny, and I hastened to put out the light and join my wife. As I was undressing, Mary said in a pleased tone, What a protection against burglars he'll be, won't he? Quite so, I answered, rather taken aback. I hadn't thought of that. All night long I dreamed of Ram chasing me through space, and for some inexplicable reason he wore a turban and two pairs of embroidered slippers. What a day! First our Irish maid got me out of bed at seven. I heard her screaming in the library. Oh, sir, oh, sir, tis placed I am to see you, she announced to me as I rushed in. Thank you, Moira, I assured her. It is pleasant to find such appreciation between capital and labor, and what might the cause of all this shindy be? Such a fright, tis the rare start I had with this big ugly stuffed dog, and the face half him glowering at me. Stuffed dog, I murmured, putting on my glasses. Stuffed dog, where? And then I remembered. Ram, come on, old fellow, wake up, I called. Ram silently shook himself, wagged his tail, and barked. There, Moira. I said triumphantly, there is your stuffed dog. Gora and me goin' to be dustin' of him. Could yez believe it? 
Moira, I reproved her. There's no need for me to engage in a decision with you on the possibilities of belief. The truth in hand is worth, er, two in the corner. Ram banged his tail on the carpet and, sitting up on his hind legs, nonchalantly leaned his back against a chair. Did ye ever? The cleverness of him, cried Moira, in open-mouthed admiration. I could have sworn, had I been in the habit of doing so, that Ram, in unmistakable human fashion, closed one eye and winked. What is it? said Mary, coming in. Mary, I sighed, nothing wrong. Moira had some absurd idea that the dog was stuffed. Silly girl, how could she imagine such a thing? You must remember that the Celtic blood which courses through Moira's veins is conducive to the seeing of visions. She must be reading silly books in the kitchen at night, remarked my wife thoughtfully. I must give her something good to read. Have you an odd copy of your last book, dear? Heaven forbid you should do that, I exclaimed in alarm. She may have a bad opinion of me already. She might want me to read her cookery book in return. Oh, all right. I'll get her a book today. Will you be home for lunch? No, not today. Don't forget, Professor Veda is dining with us tonight. So he is, old pest. I'll be home earlier then. Come on, Ram. Ram cast a longing glance at the radiator and shivered, but followed me out obediently. At the corner I had a foolish fancy, and before I could control it, I had metamorphosed Ram into a mastiff, a great sleek animal with points. I mean good points, not angularities. He was sedate, though big as a young calf. I strode along, secretly enjoying the sensation I was making and I had just stopped to buy a paper when a heavy hand fell upon my shoulder. I knew that hand at once as Tilby's. It is so characteristic of the man whose proudest boast is that he is all there. All there, of course, he is, though he could give half of himself away and still be a decent-sized man. Fat, red-faced, and hardy, the type of man who wears low-necked vests and no overcoat in the depth of winter who flings open your windows and turns off your steam heat with commiserating regard for your weakness. Ha ha, Pertinax, so we are discovered, my boy. Well, I snapped out, let me hide behind you. It's my only chance of not being seen. So ho, we are married today. Sorry to see you still bundled up in your blanket. And we have a dog, and a fine doggy at that, he bellowed gazing at the mastiff with a butcherous look. I don't know so much about the we, I replied, but if your inference is that I have a dog, then you are tolerably correct. It is a dog. Certainly, what did you think it was, a corkscrew with whiskers? You funny fellows get to work too early in the morning, he boomed. I meant it is big, enormous. Of course he is. I have no sympathy with people who trail about overgrown mice. Um, maybe. But give me my old Jerry. Curb your jealousy, Tilby, I cried as I left him. The dog is one of the best, if not the best. Must have cost you a bit, he said thoughtfully. What do you think? I retorted and hurried on. I was just going into the office when I felt I could dispense with Ram's company. He must be made to vanish. He did so, though with a bored and worried air. And then I recollected that the box was at home, and that, for all I knew, I might have sent the unhappy dog to wander at large in the spirit world forever. But the deed was beyond recall. I went home early, and the first news Mary had to give me was that Mrs. Tilby had just called. I had a premonition of trouble. I was right. Mrs. Tilby, Mary continued, said her husband had told her at lunch that he had seen you with a dog, and it wasn't a bulldog. Now what was it? Oh, I know, a mastiff. She got quite angry with me when I told her about Ram. She was so positive about the size. Tilby said it was as large as a pony, and I argued and argued with her, but it wasn't any use. You don't think Mr. Tilby was... was... Mary, your delicacy is admirable. No, I don't think Tilby had been drinking, but he can't help exaggerating. 
if he loses five cents he proclaims from the housetops that he has been set upon and robbed a hundred dollar bill a good kind fellow but unreliable very unreliable i can't understand it but anyway where is ram at that moment i seemed to soar up to the ceiling thud against it and drop into my chair again he must be in the library surely i faltered i thought i heard him bark about half an hour after you went out in the morning but i haven't seen him i'll go and see my first action on entering the library was to look into the box i sighed with relief the piece of leather was there and in a trice i had ram back in the flesh he seemed very much annoyed when he shot into view and i had to do some coaxing before he resumed his former complacency i resolved to be more careful in future he's here all right mary i called out oh i'm so glad now dear go get dressed for dinner need i of course you must remember he's a professor i might have disputed the point but it was easier to obey so i retired to the bedroom i had just finished when the bell rang and i heard vita snorting out in the hall ah foglestone there you are cold weather i'm not sure that i like foglestone he's so obvious so professor i said as we sat down to dinner what is this you have been doing the man blushed like a schoolgirl that is of twenty years ago why why he stammered however did you hear of it ah i said walls have bricks remember that and you will realize how useless it is to live in glass houses ha ha very good he chirped i'm sure mrs foglestone told you ah gossip how many sins are committed in your name you can't conceal anything from a woman but the engagement is not announced yet though of course he stopped with a smirk great scott man i cried in horror you don't say you're engaged to madame terra delina what he exclaimed gazing at me blankly there's some mistake i thought you had heard i was going to marry mary ruth st john but it seems you haven't heard so this is still my secret eh he concluded beaming upon us but gasped my wife professor i interrupted with a warning glance at her whenever you choose to tell us of your engagement it is safe with me however what about this terra delina how did you come to be mixed up in the business well you see foglestone i am corresponding secretary for the alaska society of psychical research i have traveled in india and i am supposed to have some acquaintance with the occult hmm hmm i buzzed in my confusion the professor had touched on a delicate subject dear me said mary looking about her with an annoyed expression i thought it was too early for flies the professor drew his napkin over his last drop of soup yes the occult has always been with me i was nourished in an atmosphere of spirits mary bit hastily on a stalk of celery and i adjusted my tie childhood found me hobnobbing with table wrappers and thought readers the professor continued obviously my book gives a complete expose of the methods of the jim jams and so naturally you butted into this terra delina game do tell us something about it oh very simple we met in the little room of lead the door was locked there was hypatia tittlemouse of the morning moon and some others and of course madame terra delina in a chair hypatia and tittlemouse put a hand each on one of her hands and a foot on her feet i stood at her back we had hardly arranged ourselves when the madam rapped on the table three raps for yes are there ze fools here she whispered at once came two raps as there was no third rap i rapped on the floor with my heel and the others seemed terribly annoyed at something i never could make out why but they were very angry of course they would be said mary oh replied the professor rather huffily woman's intuition is finer than ours anyway we proceeded to levitation old hypatia was bending over the table when suddenly it rose up and hit him on the nose i crept under the table to see that there was no fake there was they had forgotten me 
impossible said my wife earnestly he stopped and looked at her solemnly i swear they had i stole out again behind madam all at once tittlemouse gave a yell somebody touched my ear and madam gave a louder yell as i caught hold of her toe which she had stuck into tittlemouse's ear you'll hardly believe me but that woman had slipped her foot out of her shoe deceiving the man who had his foot on it slung her foot her right one over her shoulder her left shoulder and the rest was easy and that broke up the meeting fraud fraud not that i deny the existence quite so old man but your chicken's getting cold by the by what about india see anything strange there i once saw a hindu wearing a tall hat on his turban mary remarked absently yes yes that was extraordinary but probably not what your husband meant mrs foglestone now let me see why to be sure in Pune, a fellow i met there dragged me out to some disreputable place in the bazaar usual tom-tom business and then the show started chief faker was a slim native and his first trick was to fling an egg into the air where it hung like this i said foolishly taking an apple and feigning to throw it above my head unfortunately the wretched thing escaped from my hand mary and the professor ducked their heads and i jerked my hands forward to catch it to my horror the apple stayed up swaying in a ridiculous fashion between the ceiling and the table heavens foglestone gasped the professor how how do you do it i know it's a trick i've often wondered how that hindu worked it i reached up and drew down the apple lady and gentlemen i answered quickly that is how it is done if i was to tell you you could do better than me therefore thanking you one and all tell your friends and the exit is on the right go on with your story veda and perhaps later i'll give the show away the professor rambled on oh do you really think there is something in it asked my wife oh yes but that something is trickery the hindu loves trickery it is as i might say the curry of his existence i thought furiously of a retort some snippet of shaw foglestone but none came and i smoked in silence my wife puffed a cigarette the professor nibbled a mild cigar in his spasmodic silences there was one curious episode an absurd person sam or ram came to me with a foolish trick something to do with a dog oh what was that there was a sharp bark from next door our dog explained my wife how curious he should bark when you said dog pshaw more coincidence i said staring dreamily at the wall to my horror no to my foolish amazement rather a spot of something dark appeared on the wallpaper near the ceiling the spot slowly bulged out and in the bulge appeared the head of ram his lips set in a grim grin he licked his chops slowly i was so intent on this phenomenon that i missed what veda was saying yet it did not seem to disturb me the head of this astounding dog was followed by the rest of his body till he stood right out from the wall it looked as if there was a wire through him from head to tail or that he stood on an invisible shelf slowly as if he were being lowered from the ceiling he descended it was a perfect example of levitation but without the stage accessories the waving of hands come pertinax my wife said reprovingly you are in one of your daydreams my conclusion is that all hindus are rascals repeated vega smugly but what about the dog i asked coming to my senses all oh, the dog well let's make a bargain tell me how you kept that apple in the air and i'll tell you about the dog oh that's simple veda you'll take a long horsehair soak it well in glue and point both ends when the glue hardens it makes the hair rigid one end you stick in the ceiling the other you split then when you fling up the apple you must be careful to throw it in such a way that the hair will transfix it of course when the apple is firmly on the split ends get moist curl up like hooks and hold it in position it really is the simplest trick in the world 
My explanation was received in silence. Well, I asked anxiously. Very wonderful, Foglestone, very. The professor breathed, gazing at the ceiling. And the horse hair? Oh, on the floor, probably. What about the Hindu? Well, the fellow had a box. What? Two? I ejaculated. Good heavens. No, no, only one. He was just going to open it when I cut him short. I told him I was tired to death of Hindu swindles. I beg your pardon, I asked anxiously, but are you feeling quite well? You seem to be moving about in your chair somewhat uneasily. Not at all, Foglestone, he said rapidly. Never felt better in my life. Get a cushion, Mary. Don't, don't mind me, he begged. I gaped at him. His face was flush, and he was wiggling in his seat. I'm sure you're in a draft, said Mary solicitously. Are your ankles cold? The professor's face grew redder, and he attempted to rise from the table. As he half rose to his feet, some unseen force caused him to sit back heavily in his seat with a loud ugh. What is it, Mary implored? Do tell us. You are among friends. I stared at Vita in perplexity. Ram, was he there or not? I dare not look. Ow! gasped the professor with a pained expression. Ow! What have you under this confounded table of yours, Foglestone? It seems to me as if some brute of a cat or a dog was digging its claws and teeth, he yelled. Teeth into my, pardon me, Mrs. Foglestone, calves. My wife bent and looked under the table. There is nothing there, she said, mystified. But there is. Ow, ow! Gracious Foglestone, don't sit there doing nothing. My wife says there is nothing there. I believe her implicitly, I answered blandly. Mary smiled gratefully at me. It can't be Ram, she suggested. Ram, yelled the professor, the Hindu. Ram is our dog, I remarked. I hope you cast no aspiration on his gentle character. Character be damned, the professor cried, rising and trying to get a purchase on the table. Stop, I demanded with dignity. You have said enough. I ask an apology for your language secondly for your behavior, and thirdly for your imputation as to as good a dog as ever walked. I do, Foglestone, I do, but in heaven's name. He was tugging himself away from something. I caught his arm and pulled. There was a tearing sound, his coat gave way, and he fell into my arms. Pushing me aside, he bounded out of the door, seized his overcoat, and just as I reached him, holding the coattails which I had picked off the floor, he opened the door, glared at me speechlessly, and was gone. As I closed the door, I have an idea I heard him fall down the steps. Mary came out of the library. Where is the dog? she asked sharply. I had a sudden mental picture. Have you looked under the sofa? I inquired. We both ran into the library. Sure enough, Ram was tucked up, sound asleep. He opened his eyes and grunted affectionately. Just in time, I spied a button beside him. It was the same make as the one still remaining on the coattails I still carried. I wonder what on earth was wrong with the old duck, I mused. Oh, bother him, said Mary crossly. He's crazy. I said no more. End of section 12